2023. By theme, digital transformation, development of science and technology in improving social welfare. Online conference, November 14, 2023. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the 5th International Conference in Community Development, ICCD, 2023. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and all participants. We will start the event in a moment. Please do open the camera and mute the stone. Don't forget to change your name according to the name and institution on your Zoom meeting. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera Shalom Om Swastiastu Nama budaya Salam kebajikan Good morning everyone Firstly, I would like to say The utmost gratitude toward of God For letting us together in the today ICCD event International Conference on Community Development 2023 with good and stable state of health. I would like to say thank you for your especially excellency to Mr. Budi Ari Setiadi as Minister of Communication and Information Technology, Republic of Indonesia. This doing us our speaker, Dr. Marisa Chatamas MSG, Jan Albert Lawrence School of Communication Art, Assumption University of Thailand, Dr. Sonali Agarwal Associate Professor, Information Technology Department of Indian Institute of Information Technology, Allahabad, Parayaj, India, Professor Datu Dr. Hasna Haji Harun, Faculty of Economic and Muhammad University, Zain Islam, Malaysia. Maliga Marimutu, PhD, Latrobe Business School, Latrobe University, Melbourne, Australia. Distinguished Rector of Bina Nusantara University, Rector of Sahid University, Rector of Merchubuana University, and Distinguished of Rector of Budi Luhur University. Excellency to Professor Dr. Haji Baiman Raharjo, MMMSE, as a Rector of University of Professor Dr. Mustopo Bragama, as Deputy Minister of Villages Development of Underdeveloped Region and Transmigration of the Public of Indonesia, and also Dr. Alice Teti Rusmiati, M. Whom MSE, as Chairperson of Organizing Committee. I also would like to say thank you for dear all the audience and the participants for the willingness to come and join to the event. Hereby, I am Chitreka Putri, will be master of ceremony of today's event to guide you until the event is finished. All right, I will read out the rundown of today's event, which is divine into 11 parts. One is opening to singing of National Anthem Indonesia Raya. Three is opening prayer. Four greeting from chairperson of organizing committee. Five is opening remark from rector of Professor Dr. Mustopo Bragama University. And six speech from keynote speaker. Seven token handout as symbolic to Minister of Communication and Information Technology Republic of Indonesia by rector of Professor Dr. Mustopo Bragama. 
and submission of certificate and photo session. Nine is presentation by the four speaker, and then break and preparation for parallel room, and eleven closing by MC. Without any further ado, let's start the next agenda. Is singing of Nation at Indonesia Raya. Sing singing the Indonesian Raya songs begin. Indonesia Finish. Thank you. For the next opening prayer led by Dr. Specialist Orthodontist Chokro Prasetyadi, Mr. Prasetyadi, please, we will come respectfully. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and prosperous greetings to all of us. We are all attendants on the beautiful day. Let me ask the audience to bow their heads together for a moment. As we pray according to our respective religions and beliefs. Let, let me we lead this prayer in the Islamic religions. Let's pray together. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Allahumma salli ala shaydina Muhammad. Wa ala ali shaydina Muhammad. We offer praise and grace. To you, O Allah, you allowed us to attend the series of events at the 5th International Conference and Community Development 2023 with the theme Digital Transformation Development of Science and Technology in Improving Social Welfare. We hope these events will receive your blessings. Ya Allah, by your grace, all of this can be carried out well and be beneficial for society. For these reasons, guide us to the right path, on the right straight path. Ya Allah, inspire us to always be thankful for your favor, which you have blessed us and our parents with, and to do good deeds that please you. Admire us by your mercy into company of the right servants. Ya Allah, bestow your wisdom and guidance so that we can carry out the legacy of the trust and noble ideals of the founders of our nation. Grant us to always work together, maintain ties of brotherhood, promote general welfare, educate the nation, and implement world order based on freedom, eternal peace, and social justice for all nations in the world. 
Ya Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful, forgive our sins, our parents, our leaders, the entire citizens, and the entire audience. Ya Allah, accept our deeds and glorify us. Grant our prayers. You are the most forgiving and the most answering of all prayers. Rabbana atina fitunya sana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina azabana walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Next agenda is greeting from Chairperson of Organizing Committee, Excellency to Dr. Ali Stati Rusmiati, MHOM, MSE. Please, the time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. To begin this report, let us express our thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His mercy and grace that has been bestowed upon us. I would like to thank you for the especially excellency to Mr. Budi Aristiadi as Minister of Communication in Information Technology, Republic of Indonesia, distinguished speakers from various countries, the Honorable Rector of Binus University, the Honorable Rector of Sahid University, the Honorable Rector of Merchu Buana University, and distinguished to Rector of Budi Luhur University, and Excellency to Professor Dr. Paiman Raharjo, MMMSE, as Rector of University of Professor Dr. Mustopo Bragama, and Deputy Minister, Minister of Villages Development of Underdeveloped Regions and Transmigration of the Republic of Indonesia. I also like to say thank you for dear all audience for the willingness to come and join to the event. Welcome to the Fifth International Conference Community Development 2023. Allow me to extend my warmest greetings to each and every one of you on behalf of the organizing committee. It is truly an honor and a privilege to stand before such a distinguished audience today. Ladies and gentlemen, on this occasion we can report the following. Firstly, the theme on this conference is Digital Transformation, Development of Science and Technology Improving Social Welfare with the rapid advancement of digital technologies. The theme Digital Transformation underscores the pivotal role that embracing digital transformation plays in fostering scientific and technological process. This conference aims to explore innovation solutions that harness the power of digitalization to enhance societal well-being and address contemporary challenges. Secondly, to analyze this theme, we invite experts related to the field of digital transformation, namely Dr. Marisa Chantam, MSE, Dean Arbut Lawrence School of Communication at Assumption University of Thailand, and then Dr. Sonali Agarwal, Associate Professor Information Technology Department of the Indian Institute of Information Technology, Gili Allahabad, Prayajad, India, and Professor Dr. Hasna Hajar Harun, Faculty of Economic and Muamalat University Science, Science of Islam in Malaysia, and then Maliga Marimutu PhD, Latrobe Business School, Latrobe University, Melbourne, Australia. Thank you for encouraging us with this conference.
is a testament to important of the topic discussed at both national and international level. Ladies and gentlemen, we report on this occasion that at this conference, 123 papers from various universities, both by lectures and doctoral program students, will also be presented. A part of that, 170 participants also attended his event. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to all of you who have been a part of this incredible journey. The success of this conference would not have been possible without of the collective efforts of our dedicated organizing committee, the evaluable support of our university leaders, Binus University, Sahid University, Merchu Buana University, Budi Luhur University, and Mustafa University, the profound contributors of our esteemed speakers and the active participation of every delegate in attendance. Hopefully, the success of this conference will be catalyst for even greater achievement in the future. Thank you and let's look forward to future full of innovation, collaboration, and positive change. And then next, we ask the Rector University of Professor Dr. Mustafa Bragama, Mr. Professor Dr. H. Paiman Raharjo, MMMSE, please to give a speech and officially open this event. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the next. And uh, we watch it together to remark from Rector of University of Professor Dr. Mustopo Brakama, Excellency Professor Dr. Haji Paiman Raharjo, MM, MSE, as Deputy Minister of Villages Development of Underdeveloped Region and Transmigrations of the Republic of Indonesia. The time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I also would like to say thank you to all sort person originating from different countries. Dr. Marisa Kantamas, MSc, Dean of Albert Lauren School of Communication R. Assumption University of Thailand. Dr. Sonali Agarwal, Associate Professor of Information Technology Department of the Indian Institute of Information Technology, Allahabad, Prayagre, India. Prof. Datuk Dr. Hasna Hajah Harun. From Faculty of Economy and Muamalat University, Sain Islam, Malaysia. Maliga Marimutu, PSD. From Latrobe Business School, Latrobe University, Melbourne, Australia. All of Rector from the Consortium. Dr. Malinda Irwanti Purnomo, Rector of Sahid Jakarta University. Dr. Insinyur Wendy Useno, MSc, MM, Rector of Budi Luhur University. Dr. Nelly Eskom, MM, Rector of Binus University. Prof. Dr. Insinyur Andi Andriansa, M. Engineering, Rector of Mercubuana University. I would also like to express I appreciate to the lecturer and participant of the VIP International Conference and Community Development ICCD 2023, who come from various universities, both from within and outside the country. Good morning and peace be upon us all. As the Rector of Professor Dr. Mustopo University Beragama, 
I feel very proud and honored to be in front of all of you at the Peace International Conference and Community Development ICCD 2023. First of all, let me express my gratitude for the active participation and great enthusiasm of all those who have contributed to organizing this event. The person of uh, the Minister of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology is an impression for us to continue to improve the quality of education in our country. The theme of this conference, Digital Transformation, Development of Science in Technology in Improving Social Welfare is very relevant in strategic considering that our world is currently experiencing rapid change in the field of technology and science. Digital transformation is uh, not only in a fashion but also a necessity in facing the complex challenges faced by our society. Digital transformation is not only about technological adventure, but also about how technology can be a driving force for the development of science, as well as its positive impact on social welfare. We must be technology as a tool to improve people's quality of life and span access to education and address various social problems first by our community. Education is one of the sector most effective by digital transformation. With technology, we have greater access to lending resources, enabling global collaboration in increasing efficiency and the educational process. Professor Dr. Mustafa Baragama University, together with four other consortium university, namely Sahid University, Budiluhur University, Binis University, and Merjubuana University, have been actively involved in efforts to integrate technology in education, including the development for online learning platform in innovation research in various fields of science. However, we must also recognize the challenges and risks associated with digital transformation. Technology development must be accompanied by supportive policies, prudent regulation, and protection of privacy. We need to ensure that no end is left behind in this digital era so that the benefit can be felt by all levels of society. The success of digital transformation is also depend on international conference. I invite all comprehensive participants to share experiences, knowledge and innovative ideas in order to create solutions that can be implemented globally. Cross-border collaboration is key to ensuring that we can jointly respond to global selling as improved people will be. Before I conclude my remarks, I would like to once again express my sincere gratitude to the Minister of Education, Culture, Research and Technology, all speaker, participants, committees, and all those who had contributed to the success of this conference. Hopefully, the result of the question and output produced in this conference can be 
the foundation for joint export in mapping the development of science and technology that has a positive impact on social welfare. Thank you. Welcome to the Congress. And let us together create a brighter culture through sustainable digital transformation. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. And the next agenda is speech from keynote speaker, Excellency to Mr. Budi Aristiadi, as Minister of Communication and Information Technology, Republic of Indonesia. Thank you for joining, Mr. Budi. Hello, Mr. Budi. Okay, thank you. We meet again. And the next agenda, I will mention again to speech from keynote speaker, Excellency to Mr. Budi Aristiadi as Minister of Communication and Information Technology, Republic of Indonesia. Thank you for joining, Mr. Budi. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Budi. The time is yours. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan, My Peace and Blessing be upon all us. Distinguished Rector Universitas of Universitas, Professor Dr. Mustafa Bragama, Professor Dr. Paiman Raharjo, Distinguished Rector of Universitas Sahid, Universitas Mercebuana, Universitas Bina Nusantara, and Universitas Budi Luhur. Distinguished speakers, guests, ladies, and gentlemen. We have witnessed rapid and disruptive technological development, such as situation creates a big impact on the global economy. With up to 100 trillion US dollar value added to the global economic due to digital transformation by 2025, the, the advancements of digital transformation bring opportunities to Indonesia social welfare through economic growth. By 2045, with sufficient proficiency in digital technology, our economic growth will grow and increase by up to 6.2%. Furthermore, the digital economy will contribute to 11% of our GDP by 2040, equivalent to 2.8 trillion US dollar. However, such opportunities do come with a variety of headwinds that we need to overcome together, including technological disruption, digital divide, and cyber security issues. Next slide. To optimize the potential and overcome the challenging, currently Cominfo is developing several enabling policy, which includes the formulation of the Indonesian Digital Vision, VID 2045. The vision outline the baseline achievement from the implementation of the Digital Indonesian Roadmap. Aside from that, VID also complies various insights from relevant stakeholders in the developing the necessary policy, direction, strategies, and regulatory framework. Furthermore, Cominfo also carried out the assessment of the National Digital Transformation Index. I am to provide an overview of digital transformation progress in Indonesia. The assessment itself is carried out on five pillars, which include infrastructure, government, business, society, and ecosystem, both at national and regional level. Distinguished guests, ladies, and gentlemen. Einstein once said, 
people matter more than technology. All as a million, not we must bear in our mind that technology is one of many tools to achieve our greater good, such as fostering growth and improving welfare. Let us continue to work together in her missing the power of technology for the betterment of our society towards connected indonesia the more digital the more prosperous thank you wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh shalom om santi santi om namo budaya okay thank you and the next we are have a token handout uh, symbolic excellency to mr budi hari study as minister of communication and information technology republic of indonesia by rector of professor dr mustopo bragama professor dr haji bayman rahajo mm msi okay also submission of certificate and taking photo session we inform the committee to show the photo from the screen okay we getting applause to this submission of certificate and taking photo session from the professor dr mustopo bragama university to Excellency to Mr. Budi Ari Setiadi as Minister of Communication and Information Technology, Republic of Indonesia. Thank you. And the next agenda is presentation by the four of speaker. Before we start the next event, let me introduce our moderator this morning, Excellency to Dr. Frankie MMM. TH, I will read a short curriculum video. Mr. Frankie was born in Jakarta, 20, uh, 31 January 1972. Education master degrees from Beryl, Indonesia, major of theology programs in 2014. Honorable degree from Jakarta Public University, the major of education management in 2016 and work experiences, Mr. Frankie served as head of the Center for Research and Community Service, FASCA Sarjana Program of Professor Dr. Mustopo Bragama University. And he was joined in this event from Hong Kong right now. I will try to say hello, Mr. Frankie. Good morning, Chitra Eka. Nice to see you. Hello. Nice to hear your nice voice. Nice to meet you again <laughs> right now. Uh, Frank, oh, uh, Mr. Frankie, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. And how is the weather in the Hong Kong this morning? It's quite nice. Quite nice. Uh, 20 degrees oh, nice. Celsius. Okay. Really nice. I think you have to join me here. Okay. Mr. Frankie, we will return to the event. Good luck guiding the event this morning. The time is yours. Okay. okay. Good morning. Good beautiful morning to university's leaders. I'm really happy to having you here, and to all the committee, already work hard really, and speakers, and all participants. Good beautiful morning to all of you. And I would like, uh, I would like to say many thanks to Miss Citra Eka Putri. Um, I'll join from the start at this from the beginning of the session. I'm really enjoy uh she's already um lead this kind of program with nicely okay as a master ceremony. Um I lead this ICCD program from Hong Kong, and Hong Kong local time is an hour ahead of Jakarta local times. And hopefully, all of you enjoy with this kind of programs. Uh, I'm Frankie, one of the lecturers at postgraduate in University Professor Dr. Mustopo Beragama. Again, again, it is nice to having you all of you here. Uh, let me explain a little bit about international conference 
on community development or ICCD programs. ICCD program published since 2018, 2018, organized by five universities in Indonesia. Uh, they are Merchu Buana, Sahid, Budiluhur, Mustopo Beragama, and Bina Nusantara universities. And ICCD program has uh, has a uh, has a purpose uh, to publish result of the community services activities, community service activities from the perspective many um, main perspective like uh, entrepreneurship, innovation, and so on. And we have a good, we have a best, we have a nice theme. This for well, ICCD two thousand twenty three, the theme is the digital transformations. Uh, development of science and technology in improving social welfare. Again, it's nice to having you here. And we have a uh, four marvelous, awesome, and spectacular speakers. Yeah, I, personally, I really say thank you so much for all speakers already attend this kind of meeting. You can uh, share your knowledge. You can share your um, uh, experiences to us, and hopefully all participants will enjoy uh, the programs. Uh, let me call one by one of the speakers. Uh, please, committee, open the mic of the speakers when I mention. Yeah, for the first is Hajah Dr. Marisa Krasan Tamamas. Chan Tamas. Hello, Dr. Marisa. Hello, it's already here. Ibu Dr. Marisa Chantamas from Assumption University of Thailand. Hello. Uh, could you say something from the audience? Oh, she's not coming. Okay, okay, she's not coming. Thank you, thank you so much. And a second, um, Dr. Sonali Agarwal from uh, from Institute of Information Technology, Allahabad, India. Can you say something, ma'am? Yeah. <clears throat> A very good morning to everyone. Yeah. I am delighted to uh, share this platform. So, first of all, uh, like I would like to thank all the committee members for giving me this opportunity. It's very yes. nice to see everyone here this morning. So, uh, okay. shall we proceed with the... Yeah. Please, uh, please complete. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Snali. Uh, because for the first speaker, uh, uh, not okay. coming, I think you asked the first one to will really speak. Uh, the, the third one, our speaker is uh, Dr. Hasna Haja Haron from University Kebangsaan Malaysia. How are you, ma'am? I'm okay. Morning, uh, Mr. Frankie. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us to speak on this platform. Thank you. It's nice to see your face, ma'am. Really, <laughs> comfortable, honest, and and yeah, it's, it's quite fresh. Thank you so much for attending Thank you. here. Thank <laughs> you. Okay. And the last one is um from the Latrop, from the Latrop University, Melbourne, Australia, uh, Maliga Marimutu. Hello. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Frankie. How are you, ma'am? everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for giving me this wonderful opportunity mm -hmm. to join you all in this fabulous uh, event. It's a great honor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, all participants, the program ICCD, uh, we want to start our beautiful session. with The first speaker is Dr. Sonali Algarwal. Uh, Ma'am Sonali Agarwa, Associate Professor in Information Technology Department of the Indian Institute of Information Technology, Allahabad, India. Uh, she got PhD from Indian Institute of Technology, Information Technology, Allahabad, and Master of Technology from Motial Nehru National Institute of University of Technology, and Bachelor of Technology from Bilal, um, Bilal Institute of Technology. And the most important things about her is she has over 150 publications 
and contributed significantly to international conference and research. Okay, Dr. Sonali Agarwal, you may speech, you may uh, uh, deliver your session. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Frankie. Uh, so uh, let me share my screen first and then I will start. Uh, I hope uh, my slides are visible. Uh, Can you yet, please yet. confirm? Oh, okay, already. Can you make it larger, please? Yes. <clears throat> Is it okay now? I'm still same, still same. Could you make it larger, please? Or you uh, yeah, can uh, create full mm, screen. Yes, uh, like a. Mm, Is, yeah, good. Is it one. full screen? Yes, the best one. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You made this. You may deliver. Okay. Thank you so, much. Uh, so, thanks for this uh, very warm welcome and uh, very uh, energetic uh, and encouraging moderation uh, by Dr. Frankie. So, um, first of all, I would like to welcome all the audience for this uh, very prestigious event, ICCD 2023. And it is having a, a I think it is having the interest from all the sectors, from different societal units. So uh, since I am expert in uh, AI ML, so I am raising one very important concern. So uh, just to address uh, the concerns of many of us, like can we trust AI and ML models and applications? So explainable AI is uh, for bridging the gap between the decision and the human trust. So we all can understand like whenever we are dealing with the digital world, we are using various AI, machine learning and artificial intelligence applications. And we are, uh, uh, trust, uh, we are trusting on the uh, outcomes, results uh, of these uh, applications. So here there is a very important question like how we are confident about our trust. So this is the theme of my uh, talk today. So I'm proceeding with uh, the, uh, the details. Before going ahead, uh, it's uh, my formal acknowledgement and uh, uh, gratitude towards the whole committee of ICCD 2023, including all the collaborators. I can understand like organizing such type of events are not an easy task, but this is the only way where all the academics and uh, the community, uh, this uh, industry people can uh, contribute to the society. So we all are here for some good cause. So uh, let us uh, uh, proceed and let us see how we can help the community development with the uh, with these particular uh, valuable and insightful sessions so i am having a very small contribution here with my emphasis on how this ai and ml techniques are helping us and what kind of concerns are important for the community development nowadays so i have uh, taken one very important concern this is explainable ai so explainable AI is a, uh, is a, uh, a recently developed uh, concern where we are trying to trust the AI applications. So I am starting with the background part and some of the introductory details. Then I have taken some of the uh, dimensions like what are the levels, what are the types, what are the methods. I'm also including the use cases which we are using in our day-to-day -day applications, so how these applications are affecting our lives and how we are comfortable in terms of trusting all these use cases. And finally, I will be concluding with some remarks. So uh, let us see the background part. <clears throat> so we all can see like machine learning is everywhere. So uh, you can see like if we are dealing with our emails, so even in the emails, you can see like there are uh, uh, automated folder like spam. So 
uh, this uh, categorization or classification of emails in terms of spam is going on automatically. So it is again a result of machine learning. If we are dealing with some Amazon products, especially the Alexa or some other kind of interactive devices, so it is also understanding our likings, our recommendations and uh, our preferences. So that is also a kind of uh, AI applications. We are also dealing with uh, like uh, many social media platforms where we are getting suggestions, where we are getting some kind of uh, preference list and some kind of uh, recommendations. So that is also the example of uh, machine learning and AI applications. Some revolutionary things like um, autonomous cars or driverless vehicles or uh, various industrial automa automations or the large language models nowadays, especially this uh, chat GPT and its various versions. So all these are the outcomes of machine learning and AI applications. So whenever we are dealing with these applications, there are certain concerns. First of all, are we uh, comfortable with those results? So definitely we are comfortable because it is uh, going to be a part of our day-to-day uh, -day applications and we are using it very widely. The second concern is, though we are using those applications, how much we are comfortable or how much we are like uh, confident about the outcomes of those applications. So here, uh, though very much uh, you can say like uh, definitely we are having the trust, but still we can have a question mark for some uh, critical applications. For example, if we are using certain set of automation or uh, you can say like uh, mm, uh, automated diagnostic systems, especially in the healthcare domain. So here the trust is a very sensitive issue or confidentiality is again a sensitive issue. And uh, accuracy is also very important. So here the question is, like whatever products we are using, are we getting the correct explanation? Are we getting the, uh, the a kind of uh, trust building support so that we can rely on that applications and we can use it for our uh, various purposes? So this is something where the explainable AI is going to help us. So. Uh, uh, the another background of machine learning and AI models are like they are ubiquitous in nature. So most of the time you see like uh, the applications are uh, having a wider app, uh, you can say that popularity. And uh, but sometimes these applications are having a kind of uh, black box uh, theme. Black box theme means the whatever is going to uh, develop certain logic inside those models are not very well supported in terms of explanations. So I can say like I am using an machine learning applications for some kind of uh, decision and decision is towards uh, my suppose uh, my loan application. So suppose I am getting like my loan application is got rejected. So it is a kind of deny then definitely there will be another question like why my loan application is got denied. So I want to learn like what are the parameters which are, which are weak or uh, what I can do for its improvement. So this is the problem like machine learning systems or artificial intelligence systems, they are definitely very prompt in terms of decision making. But when some user is asking for the reason behind that decision. So there are certain, uh, you can say like a uh, gap. So that gap is now uh, required to be filled because these applications are very much uh, like we are now becoming dependent on the, these applications. So since we are using it, so definitely we have all the rights to understand what is going inside those models. So here the vision is, like explanations are very important. Once the explanations are available to us, we can say that these machine learning models are having good quality. And we can also uh, uh, use uh, these machine learning models with better, uh, you can say, uh, say that understandability, trust, or with better confidence. 
So here the question comes, like how we can explain the working of these models. So there are certain good level of explainability is required. And then how we can say that, like how these explanations are going to help uh, for wider popularity of these models. So these are something which are some of the important concern. This, this we need to check. So uh, here I am proposing one more example. So you can say that uh, whenever we are using AI applications, <laughs> sorry, so if they are behaving like a black box model, so whatever computation logic building is there, if it is not known to us, so there can be various questions. So various questions like how we can trust on those decisions, how we can debug the model or improve the model, how we can get best models uh, so that efficient decision can come and whether these decisions are uh, fair or not, is there any biasing? So these are the questions which are very uh, common and um, uh, the various stakeholders, for example, like business owners, customers, IT operators, data scientists or auditors, they are very much looking for these set of questions to get answered. So uh, you can see like uh, there are various artificial intelligence uh, models which are available. Like we, we perform classification where we categorize the items which are under the category of the supervised learning. We perform clustering or we uh, like we perform market segmentations. We perform groupings. So that comes under unsupervised level. Sometimes we try to uh, classify as well as cluster together. So it is some, somehow in between them. So it is semi-supervised learning. Now, uh, the another aspect is, which is the era of deep learning, we say, or reinforcement learning, we say. So here, what we are doing, we are learning from one domain and that learning expertise we are utilizing in another domain. So that is also uh, some of the very popular uh, techniques which we are using for digital transformations. Then uh, we have recently experienced in last one year, that is the emergence of uh, natural language processing applications. So here uh, we are uh, now very comfortably and very efficiently interact with these uh, models. So for example, like nowadays we are using chat GPT where uh, we are just putting our queries and we are getting excellent results in a very uh, quick time. So that is something uh, which are a very innovative experiences while dealing with the uh, AI and machine learning models where not only we are getting the correct classified content or answers about our query, but also we are going to have many more applications uh, means tasks in an interactive way. So basically this is all the domain which where we are now uh, uh, like uh, these days we are interacting. So let us see the example of LLM models or the chat GPT uh, outcomes. So when we are interacting with the chat GPT, uh, so we are getting some of the results. So definitely it is working very fine, excellent or accurate, but, uh, but maybe we may uh, want to uh, have some more explanation or some more support, like how these queries are accurate or not if they are, uh, we are getting those answers. So this kind of explanations are still, you can say that very much not supported nowadays. So this is the concern where the explainable AI is having its role. So with this background details, I'm coming to the point about the explainable AI. So as the name indicates, so it is basically a set of techniques uh, which are having explainable models so explainable models are those models, they are having good level of searching, learning, planning, resource performance, and they are supporting optimization, accuracy, precision. And finally, the goal is to enable human users to understand with appropriate trust and so that they can effectively manage these emerging 
generations of AI systems. So explainable uh, AI is supporting the explanations. So we all know that explanations are very necessary. So whatever machine learning model we are using, if we are getting some results, so those results should always come with certain level of explanations so that we can understand how accurate those results are. And we can also learn if we want to improve those results. So what are the weak points and where we can improve? So suppose there is a deficiency in the data. So we should also know like if we can arrange better data, so maybe we can go for better results and we can have more confident, confidence about the automation or about the system which we are using. So this is the background. So if we want to develop good level of explanations for all those uh, systems, so basically we need a rich set of queries to get answered. We need to capture the causal influence. We, uh, we have to see how the important uh, means how the features are important in any data. So we need to understand how the data elements or features are important. And finally, it is also important to understand the accuracy of the model. So this is just an, another example. For example, uh, suppose we are using any AI technique to predict the readmission risk of a patient. So, uh, <clears throat> so this readmission risk uh, suppose I got that a uh, score, the score is nothing but the 78%. So suppose I recovered from a disease and my readmission uh, probability is 78%. So if doctor is saying that you are on, uh, like uh, only 25% uh, safe, but maybe the 75% chances are to get this uh, recurring uh, disease or maybe you need to come back for the treatment, then definitely I will ask like what are the important factors for which I am getting this 75% of the risk and uh, so uh, that I want to know because I want to improve that particular uh, segment. So here uh, the concern is whenever we are getting any such type of results or scores uh, which are affecting our life so it is important that we should understand what are the parameters responsible for those particular results. So this is uh, where you can understand like how the explainable models are needed. So for any outcome, uh, it should not only give the outcome, but it should also uh, explain why we are getting that particular set of outcome. So if this is the result, uh, uh, if the results are with explanations, so it can involve more number of stakeholders with better trust or with better understanding and it will serve the overall purpose of the digital transformation. So these are the two uh, very quick examples. So one is the black box AI. Here uh, we are using data and you are uh, we are getting some kind of results or uh, decisions. Uh, so here but uh, with some kind of confusion. Confusion means like why did uh, we have received that result? Uh, how we can receive, uh, how we can uh, eliminate the uh, deficiencies and all. But whenever we are using the explainable AI, so we are utilizing certain set of data and we are utilizing the models which are explainable. And finally, these models can uh, prepare more better results with the help of a feedback. And finally, when we are getting the results, so that results would be a clear and transparent prediction, for example. So here we are confident that I know why it is happening. I also know what are the missing part and I, I can be more accurate about the result and I can also be more confident about the shortcomings of those particular parameters which are not supporting for the positive or the good results. So this is where the explainability is helpful. So now the question is like how we can uh, understand the whole explainability domain. So we can understand the whole explainability domain under various aspects. So the most important aspect is to develop such models. <laughs> so to develop such models means suppose I'm using uh, any model where uh, the decision is coming to me, I need to understand 
uh, what kind of output I want to get elaborated. So that explainability can be the local or the global explainability. So suppose I'm getting some kind of score. So I want to understand why this score is too high or why this score is low. Or if I am getting any classification results, then also it is important to understand why I have got received like rejection or acceptance. So this is the first thing of explainability. So what kind of output I am getting, I need to uh, get the explanation for that. Then the another thing is, it is also important to get the explainability about the input. So uh, I also want to know like what input is required so that I can get the perfect output. So especially like if we are, uh, you know that uh, we all are flooded with the data. So too much data is available. We need to understand which data elements are important you know, for us so that we can get better results with good level of explainability. So this can be also very important. And then, uh, for example, like uh, you take the example of uh, chat GPT, you are giving your queries and immediately you are getting your result. So uh, maybe we can have a question like how it is uh, getting those results. So what kind of uh, database is uh, registered for generating those results, how it is accessing those results, how it is ranking those results. So we may be curious about the step-by-step -step performance or the step-by-step -step dealing with those models. So that can be also coming under the part of the explainability. And then finally, whatever we are getting the output uh, with explainability, there can be another level of curiosity. So for example, I need step-by-step -step explainability. So what is going on inside that black box model? I want that every step which are going to be performed, I should get a notification. I should get an uh, explanation. Or we can say that I want a pre-model explainability. So before getting the result, I need to know how this model will work and how it will produce the result. So, uh, and maybe I am looking for the post modeling explainability. So maybe once I am getting the results, with the results, I need to know all set of explanations. So there can be like pre-model explainability we, where we need to have the prior understanding how the system will work. There can be uh, like uh, explainability during working or training or uh, that model. So I need a step-by-step -step explainability or maybe I'm looking for the explainability, which is as a final outcome. So these are the, the various stages where we can have the explainability desired. So uh, we can also correlate this explainability with another term that is interpretability. So interpretability means we, how we are comfortable about the understanding uh, for any particular decision. So interpretability and explainability, it is a something which are very close terms, so which we are using exchangeably. So this is all about the background part. So now the question comes like how, uh, what kind of explanations are important? So you can say that sometimes graphical and visual explanations are important. So uh, some uh, we can say that uh, like whenever we are getting certain figure or values, so can we get it uh, in terms of some visual format so it can be easily understood. Sometimes we can say that written or auditory explanations are important. So maybe step-by-step -step representation, maybe some kind of narration, or we can say that sometimes not only the visual or auditory separately, but we need a like a composite or combined kind of explanations where some kind of alert or quick message or some kind of uh, siren or some kind of uh, like alarm can get uh, help uh, can help us for the better explainability. So I am taking a very basic and quick example. So uh, like uh, suppose you are dealing with some explainable model. So even if it is an objective, simple objective, so we should be very clear about the objective. So objective has to be explained well. Like what are the, like what we are looking for, what we want to know, what we try to achieve. And definitely the another level of explainability is with scope. 
so we should also understand what is the scope of that particular application so then we have to also understand it's a model framework so model framework maybe we are end users but at least we should know on, on what parameters this particular model is working so we need to understand all the variables we need to understand all the parameters we need to also understand all the operations which are going inside and finally what kind of results maybe it is a classification or prediction whatever we are going to achieve that has to be explained properly so once we are following all those steps with proper explanation so it will help uh, to build the uh, transparency or model trust or maybe understandability confidentiality everything you can say that we can get a good result and we that can be uh, helpful for various societal applications so uh, you can see this another side where not uh, we are trying to understand the various variables of uh, the particular model we try to understand its algorithmic detail we try to understand the role of the data points and finally we try to understand which data point is important so this is all about the model explainability so once we are building applications with the support of explainability we need to understand few important concerns like we need to explain to whom uh, why we need to explain how we need to explain when we need to explain and what are the explain explanation technique taxonomy uh, for the various type of explanation so these are some some road maps which we need to follow here i want to uh, highlight one important point that is the growing global ai regulation so according to the gdpr article 2022 uh, uh, it empowers individuals with the right to demand an explanation of how an automated system made a decision that affects them so now the uh, the situation is we have all the rights to get informed so suppose if we are getting any result with the help of some automated tool some ai systems so it the result should not only come straight forward but it should also uh, always uh, supported by certain set of explanation so basically the the era is right to get informed <laughs> so this is something which is very revolutionary no one can simply produce the result or some automated outcomes but the uh, they should have the responsible for those outcomes and they should have uh, all the level of explainability uh, catered to the interested segments regarding those particular outcomes so this is the very revolutionary thing where the ai ml models needs a lot of transformation to make uh, a trustworthy uh, worthy uh, existence nowadays so very briefly i will be giving a uh, idea about the levels types and methods so as i already told uh, in the previous slide we can go for pre model explainability means before doing any machine learning or ai application uh, steps let us explain how this model is going to work so suppose if i am calculating my uh, like a uh, score for getting a particular loan so i should know like how this score is going to be calculated then there can be interpretable models so, so interpretable models means i am looking for the explainability about each and every calculation of that machine learning model which is going to affect me for certain set of output and then i can go for the post model explainability means uh, whenever i am getting some results so those results should have the clear idea about the outcome and i should also be very clear like how these outcomes are uh, depending upon the set of inputs or set of parameters and how i can like if i want to have a relook about uh, my inputs or the data which is available so i should know like where is the gap or where is the weakness or weak point so that is something levels of three levels of explainability and then if we talk about uh, this one like uh, uh, stages so we can say that there are two types of explainability approaches uh, one is the model agnostic and second is the model specific so model specific means uh, 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 any different uh, machine learning model they have their own 
वे ऑफ एक्सप्लेनेबिलिटी टेक्निक्स मॉडल एग्नोस्टिक मीन्स देर आर सर्टेन जनरल एक्सप्लेनेबिलिटी टेक्निक्स डेवलप्ड एंड इट कैन बी एप्लीकेबल टू एनी मशीन लर्निंग मॉडल then we can have the local and global explainability local means a very close step by step global means all together whatever results we are getting we can get a uh, 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 general explanation then we have explainability based on the problem time or the domain is specific so suppose if we are dealing with the healthcare domain where the uh, the automated results are very sensitive very critical so maybe we need a different type of explainability suppose we are dealing with the financial domain or suppose we are dealing with suppose let us see the social media domain so here the criticality may be little less as compared to the healthcare and financial domain so so that can be uh, uh, understandable so these explainability are also based on the data type like sometimes we have the input data uh, depending upon the various uh, characteristics for example like input data is textual data so accordingly we need to get the explainability or inputs are nothing but certain set of time series data so we have uh, uh, the results to be address those time series requirements so basically depending upon the input format or the output format different level of explainability is are important so this is the very quick review uh, about the uh, explainability uh, examples like uh, we have its use in various kind of ai applications we have its use in various kind of machine learning so sometimes the uh, as a result of explainability we are getting dependency plots feature importance some surrogate models we have the explainability requirements in terms of computer vision applications so for example if i am getting a certain set of uh, uh, like uh, uh, pattern recognition so uh, that pattern recognition should also supported by the uh, the some set of like um, explainability part so for example like if i am air at the airport and maybe my uh, face is not going to be scanned well so maybe i can uh, immediately i need an answer like why my face is not uh, scanned so maybe i am wearing the specs which is reflecting so i should understand like how these vision models are working similarly the explainability is important for any kind of strategy similar uh, summarizations it is important for various planning phases it can help us to understand the scope of the search the results of the search it can understand for the game theory like which features are important for designing a game it is also helpful for the robotics related applications and finally the natural language applications so explainability is required it is demanded everywhere and if we are dealing with some kind of diagnostic applications so then also explainability is very much needed so these are some of the use uh, areas where the explainability is very much important or very much required so finally i am going for some of the very quick coverage of uh, its uh, current status and uh, you know, the matrix and thread off challenges and some of the important remarks so explainability is supported by the seven matrix so you can say that whenever we are dealing with the explainable models so uh, it should have transparency it should have domain sense because different domains are having different level of sensitivity it should have the consistency consistency means uh, maybe for use case 1 use case 2 it is uh, it should have the same kind of results it should have the parsimony so basically uh, it should work in a very uh, like you can said that generalized aspects not any person is specific or not any scenario specific and then finally it should support our trust and performance as well as the fidelity uh, related concerns so these are the metrics for the explainability part so we can say that whenever we are dealing with the explainability actually we are looking for the comprehensibility susceptibility so basically we want a very concise and very compact explanations we want explainability uh, with actionability so we should also get the idea like what are the immediate actions required uh, so that we can have the better uh, understanding of the model then we should have the reusability so can we personalize those explanation since we should get support in terms of understanding the accuracy part or the completeness part so these are the mini matrix 
uh, after that we can say uh, that like uh, there is something which are important while getting the explainability so uh, you can see this graph it is very uh, understand uh, means very interesting so if there are uh, models which are uh, like this is the reality those models uh, which are simple uh, simple means uh, obviously they are easy to understand but they have poor performance this is the reality but we know uh, right now we are dealing with for example like uh, deep learning models let us see the chat gpt models they are having very good performance but we have poor explainability about their functioning so functioning means why, <coughs> why it is categorizing any particular uh, data or maybe any particular results so we are not getting those explanations uh, in the same way we uh, in the same rate where we are getting the results so results are very fast but if suppose you answer like how you have received that result so maybe the uh, internal logic explanation may not be that fast so this is something which is a kind of uh, a, a, a kind of a gap so we should have a trade off trade off means we want a high interpretable system with good level of accuracy here you can see here the interpretable systems are high but they are having poor accuracy so this is the trade off which we want to achieve like accuracy should also be high and explainability or interpretability should also be high so that we can finally enjoy the system which we are using with good level of fairness performance transparency as well as some other concerns for example like privacy so uh, let me uh, conclude this so xai is having lot of future scope because interpretability is necessary and it is uh, very important with any ai models but those ai models whenever they are producing the results they should be more responsible so basically the ai term is incomplete now when we say the artificial intelligence or ai we should include explainability with it and we should also include responsibility with it so ai is now transferring in terms of responsible ai when we talk about the responsible ai so we say like we are expecting more fairness we are expecting more accountability it should be more uh, ethical it should ensure the privacy it should ensure the transparency and it should ensure the security and safety of all the stakeholders for all the applications and that is the way where we can actually say like we are getting the full or maximum result of our digital transformation so many societal applications those are based on ai uh, applications or ai outcomes they should be now not only the ai applications but they should be now the responsible ai applications where we can ensure all these kind of expectations uh, to uh, uh, to be supported and finally we can rely upon those models so with this i can uh, i am now at the end of my session so uh, i can be uh, interactive uh, for any kind of question answer if i am getting some response from the audience uh otherwise uh, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity and sharing my thoughts about the digital transformation scenario where the ai models artificial intelligence models they have the new you can say that challenge and this challenge is nothing but to behave more responsible to behave more explainable and to get better confidence and better trust from all sectors and for all segments of the uh, stakeholders so with this i am taking a pause thank you everyone okay thank you so much uh... yeah uh... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not getting the voice. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Sorry. 
Yeah, yeah, no. I'm okay, okay. I'm okay. okay. Uh, it's nice to <laughs> so hear your presentation. Been... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um okay. before before we uh, give the time to participants who already raised arm, I think we have uh, uh some one one very important things based on your uh, presentation, ma'am. Um uh, your 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 team is can we trust AI? Can we trust AI? It's nice questions. Um, I have I have experiences in Hong Kong. I have what experience and bad experiences in Hong Kong. Why? Because um, why why uh the, the Chat GPT banned it in Hong Kong? And my message is your your Chat GPT account is blocked. What what happened? What happened, ma'am? Uh, maybe like uh, we are getting more dependent on that and like for example like there are ethical concerns like in academics students are uh, doing the overnight uh, completion of the assignment with the help of chat GPT they are not actually naturally exercising upon those questions so this is something which are very challenging like how we can ensure this ethical use of those large language models Yes, because you already mentioned about the chat, chat GPT. I'm directly to uh to um, action to do my computers. I'm searching for my GPT, but the message is not not quite good to hear. Yeah. Okay. So this ethical concern is there. Like if we are using AI model, so we should be ethical also. Okay. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. We we invite uh, Maya Mahara. Uh, from University Sahib, uh, you may ask him the, your questions uh, to her. Yes. Maya Maharani, you may ask him your questions. I think you have to open your mic first. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um... I like uh, the slide uh, which show about the AI taxonomy. So my question is, okay. what is the most key component uh, to decision making, to making decision related AI application? Because uh, two years ago, our team, including me, uh, we made uh, smart agriculture for detecting plant pest. So that is my question. And I'm, I'm sorry, my background is uh, not in uh, informatic technology, but my background is in environmental. Thank you. Okay. So uh, uh, if I understood your question well, so uh, basically, uh, you are talking about the taxonomy and you are uh, basically interested to know what are the important uh, point parameters for the uh, explain explanations, right? Yes. The key was... Okay. So, uh, so basically, we all understand that uh, data is important for any kind of uh, outcome which our um, AI and machine learning applications are giving. But again, the thing is like uh, data is having a very large coverage. So here I can say that not only data is important, but certain features, certain parameters of those data is important. So whenever we are building an uh, AI model, and if we want to explain like how this AI model is important, so feature importance, so calculation of feature importance is something where we can uh, get better explainability to convince the out outcomes to any end user. <laughs> so suppose I am giving certain kind of prediction to you. So not only the prediction is important, but I should also say, for example, let us see the weather prediction. So I should also come up with that prediction score with the important features and it's a contribution towards that prediction. So suppose there is a, a wind pressure, there is a humidity, there is a temperature or there is some other parameter. So I should say like uh, wind pressure is having 75% uh, uh, contribution for this decision and maybe humidity is having only 2% contribution or some 
this percent of contribution. So basically, I can say like explainability can be supported very well with the help of calculation of feature importance. So here, if we are giving that feature importance, so the users and users can understand how they, these results are oriented towards their input uh, parameters. So I think uh, feature importance are very important for any kind of explainability. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh. Uh, I hope uh, I uh, somehow answered the question. Um, thank you, Madam Maya. Sonali. Thank you, Ms. Sonali. Because our project now is, uh, uh, we we will to make a smart halal food distribution center, and we need mm. uh the AI uh, which can trace ability and trust ability for food halal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Okay. Mr. Okay, the, the good discussion. I think, uh, Madam Maya, I think you can to invite uh, Sonali uh, go to your universities to discuss proceedly. Yeah, you can uh, meet each other to discuss deeply uh, about this kind of uh, program you want to uh, discuss with her. And again, thank you so much for uh, Miss um, Sonali Agarwal. Thank you so much for your presentation. And our community, our committee will give you like a speaker a certificate uh, to you. Committee, you may please do so. The committee, please. You want to give like a certificate to her? Hello, committee. Committee. Okay, just a moment. The message is just a moment. Nice, yeah. This the this is a function of uh, information technology. Uh, when we ask in the question and not sound there, and finally the statement there, statement there. Thank you so much, committee. You work very well this kind of programs. Yeah, uh, we have a second a second speaker. Um, Dr. Marisa Chantamas from Thailand. Yeah, before she deliver the presentation, the committee will deliver like uh, a certificate, electronic certificate for the speakers, Sonali Agarwal. Uh, you really deep explanation, ma'am. <laughs> deep uh, explanation, yeah, really technically. Uh, very nicely and uh, a bunch of uh, uh, knowledge about the technical uh, for AI. Really, Thank I you. really enjoy it. Thank I you. really enjoy it. Thank you. Uh, I am also very much uh, excited to be here. So it's a very nice uh, interaction. Yeah. So I can see like everyone is uh, having this very energetic morning or afternoon. So so I wish uh, good luck to all the participants and let us see the new world. Let us see the yes. more uh, trustworthy world together with good level of digital transformation. So with this, uh, I may take a leave now and all the best finally, to all the participants. Finally, <laughs> finally, and Ibu uh, Ma'am Sonali you. Agarwal. Thank you. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> I yes, the, the certificate already. So thanks for already this honor. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks for this honor and thank you very much. Okay, success for your career. Success for. Okay. Yeah, okay same, same you. to you. Same to you. Okay. Thank Please you so much, ma'am. Thank you. The second presenter, the second speaker of this uh, ICCD 2023 is Dr. Marisa Chantamas. Uh, hi, Marisa. Hello. Hello. Hi. Can you uh, can, can you can you 
Yes. Say okay. something from your audience. Yes. Hello. Can you see? Can you all hear me? Yeah. Absolutely. And can Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. So good morning, and I'm sorry for the uh, inconvenience this morning. That's so, very okay. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, so again, I would like to uh, show my appreciation for you know inviting me over and um, listening you know, to what I have to say. So basically, I will take a very different approach um, because my field is going to be communications and creative work. So uh, what we're going to talk about is going to be about how um, you know we can use AI for creativity for impact. Uh, that is a theme that we have for the Advertising Association of Thailand this year. So uh, we're talking about how uh, we can use technology to create impact in AI. Okay, and uh, the response, the kind of response that we get from people. Uh, of course, you have maybe, you know, you've got all the technology knowledge. So basically, when we creatives or people in the communication industry look at the kinds of information that we will be using to process. Uh, it will be things like behavioral data. You know, we want to know what people are doing. Mm. Uh, for example, you said your chat GPT account was blocked in Hong Kong. Uh, maybe it's China internet firewall, you know. So yeah, so it's uh, behavioral data, right? It's also contextual data, meaning, you know, what do people, uh, let's say, for example, it's raining, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you are grab or you are, you know, some sort of delivery service, and you want to promote to people that, you know, you have delivery service during the raining, you know, instead of coming out for dinner or lunch, you can always, you know, have a delivery. There's also these things like psychographic data. You know, they want to know about your personality, your values. Um, you may also notice, you know, in your social media, there are loads of feeds that, that seem to cater to your interests. If you like to travel, you like to eat, uh, that sort of thing. And we also have, you know, demographics. Those are basic, right? You know, information about your age, your gender, marital status. And also, okay, we have things like geographic data, where you live, okay, because um, again, you know, there are things like RFID where you could have, you know, uh, promotions in a certain area, or you can have it on a bigger scale, like a certain cell site, you know, promotional activities. So you can have all of those things. And I have lots of examples to show you. So uh, we will be able to uh, have you understand how we use this basic information in, um, you know, developing creative work. Now, one of the things that's happening in marketing is that, you know, we, we talk about the change in targeting consumers. Uh, in the past, in marketing, we talk a lot about things like demographics. But today, uh, as I told you, you know, when we look at the information about the consumer, we look at so many information. We look at your behavior, psychographics, context, geographic location, your lifestyle. So targeting is, uh, you know, based on demographics is no longer a feasible thing because we look more on the lifestyle. We look more on consumer groups that are different. You know, it's not, and I will be showing you some cases about that. Well, so you'll be able to see that, you know, uh, consumers are changing and the way we as marketers or communicators need to change as well. So basically what we're starting to see is that it, more important than the demographics itself will be things like access to technology. You may are, you probably are aware of things like the, um, you know, the gap between the haves and the haves not in the technology. And actually it has a major impact. For example, in Thailand, we have a, the government was trying to uh, stimulate the economy by giving uh, money to the people. And so they, they gave it through uh, internet, uh, an application that is a kind of like a banking application. So that really changed the game because before that, a lot of people still use cash. So now we are a cashless society. By cashless, I mean, we don't have money, but yeah, you know, you do it digitally as well. Okay, so the access to technology is very important and the government has to play a role in leading 
the people as well. It isn't just about, you know, watching, you know, social media or that sort of thing, but also being able to uh, make purchases digitally. And the government new policies, they want to use blockchain, uh, but I'm not sure they can do that. But, you know, that's that's the point about the technology. So access to technology is very important. And people are living freely, meaning that, you know, in Asia, we are starting to be more progressive. People are more liberal. I'm sure you see a lot of those changes in Indonesia as well. So we are starting to see that, you know, people can move, right? They can move from cities to cities. They can uh, move from the rural area to the city and they have their own lives. And, you know, they might even have double lives. Like, you know, they're one person offline, they're another person online. So that's one of those things that we're talking about, their freedom to choose. And also we're talking about their ability to connect socially. Right. Like we're, we're connecting now. Right. I mean, I don't know Frankie as, a, you know, before this, but now I do know. Right. So if I run into you, you know, if I go to Indonesia, I'll, I'll, I'll recognize you. So being able to be connected socially changes people. Uh, you can also see it both positively and negatively. I mean, there are groups of people, for example, in Thailand, we 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 start to have a lot of this, um, you know, the K-pop thing. And we probably have like, you know, the, uh, they call it like the fandom and they come together and they have activities together. You know, they would buy, uh, how to say it, billboards and, you know, for happy birthday to their favorite celebrity. And that's because they can connect socially, you know, on the digital social platforms, because before this, they can't really group up this well, right? So, you know, this power of connection through social media is very important. And finally, we also start to see that people are starting to recognize that money is not everything. It's almost everything, but it's not everything. So uh, people want more than just wealth. People want to have experiences. And this is why, you know, uh, as communicators, as people who are doing creative work, we really have to understand the importance of these experiences. Okay, so I will be showing you you know, some of the cases that talk about this. Also, we start to see this real-time marketing or prediction marketing, right? You start to see things that are, you know, in the past when we do the marketing, right? We plan three months ahead, six months ahead. Now you can't plan. It happens day to day, you know, things happen. Uh, for example, in Bangkok, uh, I'm sure your city will never have something like this because you should learn from us. Okay, we have a lot of weird things happening. There was this truck that actually ran on the road that was under, um, they were having a construction to remove the electricity lines. You know, you know, Thailand's really ugly. You know, when you come to Bangkok, you see those electric lines running all over and you can't see anything. So the governor is trying to put it underground. So they have this, you know, platform to cover the hole and cars can run over it, right? But there's this huge truck ran on the road, fell into the hole. <laughs> it's like, I mean, you know, Bangkok is amazing. And so everybody captured that moment and started to have the, you know, creative, you know, inputs to that, you know, like, oh, this is not going to happen if you did this or, you know, something like that. So we start to see that when you do real time marketing, it means we have to always keep a pulse of what consumers are interested in because consumers change their minds very fast. You know, they might be interested in something and then next week it's something else, okay? So we see that a lot. And also we have predictive analytics. I'm sure uh, the previous speaker really explained a lot about how AI works. And the same thing happens in marketing. We look at things like predictive analysis. Um, they, they follow you. I'm sure you're aware, very aware of this, you know, tracking uh, among applications. Like for example, if you, you know, uh, bought a plane ticket on Agoda, all of a sudden you might get an offer for, you know, a, what you might call it, a suitcase, for example, right? So we, we start to see these things or we can start to see things like, okay, it's, you know, uh, you're going on a certain road, right? Things as basic as Google map. Okay, so we start to see these things happening Okay, and in marketing, it's changing very quickly. 
Also, we have a lot of outdoor advertising. Now, outdoor in the past, right? Boring billboards. I'm sure you're aware of that, you know, billboards that stay there. But nowadays, the billboards are digital. And because they're digital, they can be connected to a lot of other things. And that's what I want to tell you is that when we talk about the communications and we talk about the technology, um, you know, as the previous speaker said, you know, we, we talk about, can you trust it or not? Uh, I I look at it as a tool, you know, um, I, I understand, you know, the philosophical things behind all of it. And, you know, but for us, it's a tool. It's a tool to create magic. OK, uh, I think that that is the most important thing that you have to understand, because, you know, people live in the moment. OK, and um, a lot of times they just want to have a bit of excitement. So uh, let me talk a bit about the case of, um, you know, data could be fun and I will uh, change my sharing a bit. OK, and I will share the um, case study of this particular uh how to say it it's um it's a campaign by british airways and basically um it's it's you know a lot of complicated data right but um it the result is just magical okay let me show you Public saw as magic was actually a carefully orchestrated feat of technology. We mounted an ADSB antenna on the roof of a nearby building to read live data directly from each aircraft's transponder within 200 kilometers. All aircraft emit radio waves containing their speed, altitude, GPS location, and a call sign. Our antenna was connected to a PC with a custom built application which identified the British Airways planes and sent the data to our cloud server that controlled the billboards. We created a virtual trigger zone in the sky that acted like a tripwire, so that when a BA plane entered our trigger zone, within 0.2 seconds we'd cross-reference the registration number with flight data from Heathrow to determine the destination. Cloud altitude data told us if the plane could be seen, and if it could, the information was sent to our billboard. Interrupting the current content and playing our ad. targeted a moment, the moment a plane flies overhead, inspiring our audience to share what they saw. And igniting their passion to explore the world. So this is a case from uh, British Airways, and you can see how they use the technology to create a magical moment. So I think that's where creativity meets technology, if you understand what I'm saying. Okay, and British Airways uh, continuously does this, okay, as their campaign. So I'll show you another campaign that they've done. And this one is uh, a bit more modern and it's actually talking about the contextual data I was talking about, how location, how, you know, the current temperature has an impact on what we can do as communications in, you know, digital platforms.
So you can see that this is a uh, more contextual, right? It has to do with the current weather. It has to do with the location, like the uh, gust of wind from the tube trains. So the tube trains about to come and you get that particular message. So you can see how engagement is being created by all of this technology. And, you know, I mean, as much as I can understand, you know, the, um, the concerns that we have about technology, but this is how, you know, creativity can be realized. I mean, imagine if you had to do this, you know, manually, it would be impossible. Okay, so this kind of creativity is made possible because of this technology itself, or even something like this. Uh, a lot of it's like British stuff. And I think it's because, you know, they have a lot of things to play. And this one is an AR. Uh, you guys probably are aware of augmented reality, right? And the scale of augmented reality, if it's just in your phone, it's not quite as fun. So this is uh, another application that I think is really fun. So you can see that we play a lot with moments, right? But let's take another step and make it a bit bigger. Um, I'm sorry that this is a, a, an alcohol product. I hope it, you know it's just for a case study. So please don't mind the fact that it's alcohol. But this is a very smart way of using AI to detect certain information and making it a whole campaign, okay? The origins of Stella Artois date back to 1366, to a small brewery in Leuven, Belgium. During the following years, it expanded to the whole of Europe, to what we now know as Stella Artois. We crossed our historical data with art history data and came up with a probability. First, we focused on the color of the beer and the type of glass to determine the style of the brew. Then, after establishing each painting within its creation date and geolocation, we crossed it with the brewery's current expansion. And finally, to narrow down the probability, we compared this data with the presence of Artois competitors during that time. By connecting all these variables, we could calculate that the beer being portrayed in all these paintings could, in fact, be an Artois.
So uh, that is, uh, again, okay, uh, it, product aside, I think it's a very, very fun way of looking at the data and using technology to create a very engaging moment. I mean, imagine, you know, being able to say Renoir painted uh, ad for Stella Artois without even knowing it is a conversation piece. And so I think that, you know, um, I understand that, you know, you talk about technology and all that, but, you know, technology could be fun. Now, let's talk about less fun technology, outdated technology. Do you still read your emails? I'm sure you don't. And uh, especially when the email comes from, you know, those advertising products. So this is a very interesting case. Uh, let me explain the concept a bit before you watch it. It talks about doppelganger. And, you know, maybe in Asia, we don't really give that much of an importance to it. But, you know, the Westerners, they have this obsession with the idea that there's a copy of you somewhere in this world, which is not true, obviously. Right? We're all unique. But anyway, there's this idea of a doppelganger. And this brand of fast food tried to use this concept to get people to read emails. Let's see how they did it. Okay. <laughs> The average person deletes about 70 emails a day, most without even reading them. So how does Chipotle get people to actually open emails? Simple, by telling them they're not special. This is Chipotle doppelganger, and here's how it works. Chipotle's menu has only 53 ingredients, but they create millions of possible combinations. With so many options, it may seem improbable that an order could be duplicated exactly but we prove to our customers that even their weirdest concoctions have a doppelganger, an evil order twin. By scanning millions of orders every day, we matched pairs of people who ordered the exact same thing at the exact same moment in two different places. The doppelgangers get an email showing their identical orders, plus the time and the location of both restaurants. The shocking revelation made this perhaps the only email ever to be used as a green screen on TikTok. So I get this weird email from Chipotle and the subject line is alert Chipotle doppelganger detected. So obviously I open it. If you're in Plainfield, Indiana and you ordered a chicken quesadilla with no beans, hit me up. In just the first four weeks of the campaign, 466,000 emails were sent. The email click rate was 176% above benchmark and the doppelgangers delivered $4.8 million in revenue from an email. Turns out you don't need big offers or discounts to get people to open your emails. You just need a technically elaborate and oddly delightful insult to remind you that you're not special and someone in St. Louis just ate your burrito. Again, you know, I think that because we have a lot of data, right? Um, it's very important to know what you can do with it because data could just be sitting there. I mean, imagine they have all this sales data forever and they decided to take a spin with it, you know, because uh, this is what creativity is all about. So I think that, you know, I mean, well, I'm a creative, right? That side of things. Uh, I probably, I can't do much math, but at least, you know, we can tell people that, hey, this is one thing we want to be looking at. And I think that, uh, that is the future. It isn't about, you know, data, data. It's about looking at it together. Another interesting case, I'm sure you all had spam or, you know, those like, uh, how do you say, illegal um, kind of scammers call you, right? Or send you messages that they trick you to, you know, press certain buttons and, you know, uh, send money or something like that. I'm sure these scammers are all over the place. And in this case, okay, they made this a campaign for a delivery company. Uh, I'm sure you knew that Argentina won the World Cup, right? And it's a big thing in their country. So let's look at this case study. <laughs> Suddenly, I get a notification from Pedidos. Yeah, what the hell? I didn't order anything. I'm broke. What the fuck? I got scammed. I didn't order anything, pieces of shit. Why did Pedido Shop, the number one delivery app in Argentina, send a fake push notification to all its users? Argentinians waited for the cup for 36 years. And finally, the national team delivered. The country was completely. 
madness. But something was missing. The World Cup trophy. People are waiting for the trophy. At full speed, we cross-checked the flight number with public data from an aerospace traffic map and linked it to our delivery app. So right as the airplane wheels lifted off Qatar's soil, six million Benito Shah users took the bait. To everyone's surprise, the classic delivery map, instead of a cheeseburger, showed the World Cup's journey home so every Argentinian could follow it in real time. When I open it, you make me to tears, Benito Shah. Clap, clap, clap. It was the club. I think I love Benito Shah. Therefore, a simple push notification achieved something incredible, making Benito Shah have 32% more mentions than Messi. On the day the whole country was thinking of Messi and Argentina becoming champions, the Pedito Shaw hashtag reached the top of the trending chart organically, turning it into the most viral brand action of the World Cup. We reached more than half the country, and all of that with an investment of zero dollars. But this kind of campaign is a bit, you know, scary, you know, because in a way, people will feel about being scammed, right? It it really has to have this, you know, really twist to it that is positive. Otherwise, you know, it could get very negative because people don't like to get messages, especially things that are, you know, that look like scam. Okay, so um, this is a, a bit of a sensitive issue. And finally, this one isn't uh, technology, but it's actually uh, something that I think picks at the heartstrings of all of us. Um, and that is because sometimes we use technology, and that's why I want to end with this piece, is because sometimes we use technology so much that we forget that uh, we have family sometimes. Okay, so uh, this ad comes from a uh, chicken, roast chicken company. You know, in Thailand, when we don't know what to eat, we, we buy this roast chicken home because it's easy. You know, it's like, you know, you've got the sauce, you've got everything. So you don't have to do anything except, oh, you don't even have to buy rice. You know, they have it for you. So uh, this chicken is something that is a part of the family meal for so long. What happened is that um, they want to tackle a problem with the society that people have, uh, how to say, give a lot of importance to social media and less to the real people, okay? So I'll show you this piece, this comes from Thailand, okay? And I'm very proud because this is my student who is the uh, chief creative officer of BBDO Bangkok who did it. อันนี้ต้องเพลงญี่ปุ่นได้นะคะเป็นเพลงญี่ปุ่นนะคะอันนี้ก็ค่ะ <coughs> ไม่ได้กลับบ้านเลยปีๆอีกปีแล้วเนาะแบบจะชื่อกิจตารายเลขยันชื่อเล่นชื่อวันลูกนั่นแน่นั่นแน่คนนั้นเนี่ยคนส
I think that this is a very, uh, how to say, touching case. And I want to end it with this by saying that technology has a lot of possibilities. But the most important thing is the person who is important to you. Uh, so we don't, you know, uh, how to say, use technology to the point that we forget that. Technology uh, can do so many things for us, but it can never replace the people we love. So I think that that is my uh, talk for today. Okay, I hope you enjoyed it. And I do, um, I mean, I'm willing to take any questions if you have any. Thank you. It's amazing, Marisa. I think this is a very amazing and very um creativity yeah yeah you 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 already deliver your presentation with us and some kind of creativity and in my thoughts right now is creativity is all right and uh -huh. all need creativity to show yeah. how you're feeling to show how who you are in the in the uh -huh. in the creative perspective okay i give one um participants if you want to ask any question to marisa you may do so any of you want to raise your hands and asking your questions? Yeah. I tell you, your material is quite uh, complete and significant uh, give impact to them, maybe. <laughs> okay, if no one to asking the questions, uh, the committee, um, we would like to thank you so much for your um, participation, Marisa. And so uh, the committee will... Yeah, the committee will be giving you like a EA certificate as a presenter. Ah, oh, thank the you committee. very much. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's the certificate, hopefully. Um, yes. Uh, um, the, it's quite creative for you. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, okay yeah. Marisa, the closing statement from you. You yeah, thank you very much. Um, it, I really appreciate it, and I do hope that you know you got you know some good information or some good insights into what you can do with you know data. Thank you very much. Okay, see you. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. We have a marvelous for the third speaker, uh, from Malaysia. Professor Dato Dr. Hasna Haji Harun for University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Uh, Ma'am Hasna, you can deliver your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Frankie, I will try to share my screen now. So are you all able to see not yet, ma'am. I think it's still progress. Oh, yes. Not yet. Oh my god. I started screen sharing. Can can I request the 
assistance of the organizer, please. I've already emailed okay. Okay, one of the committee, please help uh professor to to share his her materials. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, let me help Prof. Hasna. I'm Puti from Minus University. Yes, thank you so much, Puti Minang. Thank you so much. The theme of the presentation this moment is uh, uh, digital transformations in community development of Malaysia and Indonesia. This is very good and very interesting topics uh, that uh, Professor will, will deliver to us. And we invite some of you or two, one or two people to, um, yes, getting closer with this kind of session. Uh, Professor, the material already showed up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frankie. So as you can see, uh, I think I'm the eldest of all the speakers. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, I thank actually the organizer for inviting me to give a talk on this topic. And uh, especially to Dr. Uh, Retno Dewanti, who has been uh, organizing the conference for so many years. Eh? Mr. Frankie, if it's uh, one uh, hour earlier in Hong Kong than Indonesia, in Malaysia, it's actually one hour later. So now it's it's 11.30. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much. Um, my presentation will be different from Dr. Sonali as she is into information technology. So much that I've learned from her presentation as she has spoken about uh, what you call that, the ethical side of uh, artif uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah? And also Dr. Marisa, very young presenter. I've learned a lot also from the video sharing. You know, I'm beginning to understand that there's also human values that needs to be considered. All right, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Puti, please. Can I... Um, can we move on to the next slide? Okay. So if you look at the agenda, it's, it's a lot of things there. But what I'm going to talk about is just a cursory overview of the experiences of Malaysia, especially uh, with regards to the digital economy journey, and a little bit of uh, Indonesia uh, digital roadmap, plus uh, our Malaysian budget, what is our emphasis on digitalization, and maybe uh, the challenges and examples of technology, especially for the community. So uh, that's a cursory view of the event. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Uh, okay. So uh, so as what the previous uh, speakers have mentioned, uh, you can do so much with uh, you te uh, technology and it has been proven to be very beneficial. And uh, there's uh, what you call that artificial intelligence and then there's big data, internet of things. So everything is coming our way. Even for lecturers in the university, we are finding it quite challenging actually to meet up to the uh, digital transformation. Students are using chat GPT for them to do assignments. But in our university, oh, by the way, Dr. Mr. Frankie, I'm actually from University Science Islam Malaysia. Okay, uh, so uh, for chat GPT, they actually allow the students to use, but there will be an interview session with the students uh, to see whether they understand what they have uh, taken up. And also the students are required to come up with references. Yeah, So uh, that's what's going on in, uh, in the academic world. So if we can move on, can I? I'm not able to. Okay. So uh, uh, connectivity, changing everything, you know, uh, we, we have uh, what you call that disruption in the normal things that we do, even in business, uh, even in uh, government agencies and also universities. So it's very, very important that we look at this seriously on how we are going to chart our way forward so that uh, the, uh, the country will benefit from AI. Having in mind also, there's also the ethical aspect of uh, AI. Talking about scam, eh? in Malaysia, uh, there's lots of issue about, actually the most popular is Macau scam. I think many people have uh, lost millions of dollars, actually in total, the government mentioned the other day. And mostly it's the pensioners and those working in the rural areas. So they have not much, what you call the experience with IT, so the minute they receive a call or a text or an email, they will be jumping, you know, uh, thinking that it's it's really a, 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 a 
what they call that a notification from the court asking them to declare the assets etc and how that is how they actually worked and then uh, transferred their money because they are they are asked not to reveal uh, what they are doing to the authority so at the end of the day uh, it's 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 sad thing to see that people have been working so hard they've been what you call that investing their money from the effort that they have gone through you know and suddenly it's just lost like that so so far i have not heard of any um buddy who has lost lots of money and getting it back so it is a sad thing so the recent uh, scam is about calling the individuals telling them that uh, there is a parcel for you somewhere and you are asked to uh, give your address etc you know your details so that they can send to you so that's another hoax eh? So talking about that, I think uh, we have to be very careful with this uh, technology uh, era uh, to make everybody alert of what's going on. Okay, so if we can move on to the next slide. Okay, this is just uh, an, an overview of the IR, Industrial Revolution, over the years. So we started out in 1780 with mechanization of manufacturing industry. And then we have in the 1870s, mass production. In the 1970, IR 3.0 uh, talks about the automation of production using electronics. Yeah? And IR 4.0, there is a little bit of introduction of Internet of Things and people are talking about uh, the, uh, how to advance AI. And, um, and IR 5.0, which is now coming into being, is the integration of human beings with machine. So I think various examples have been given by the uh, previous speakers. But uh, if I can just give a small example of uh, everyday usage of uh, what's happening now, you know, people are in the car, for example, uh, my daughter usually uses her handphone and then sort of uh, connect it to the, uh, the car radio so that she can control whatever she wants to hear. And there's also smart uh, house, smart home, we call it, when using the remote, you can actually lock the house, you know, and also uh, put on the lights, etc., and then also uh, there are various uh, tracking of customers' habits now for the industry to see uh, what customers prefer, what they have bought over the years, and you know, what are their location. In the university context now, I think the universities are using AI also to churn out data about students' uh, intake, you know, where they are, uh, whether they are from lower income or uh, higher income group. And how do they perform actually? Eh? And, and all those data. So all this is made possible because of the AI, eh? artificial intelligence, where they can make use of big data sets, identify patterns, just what just like what Dr. Sanalia was talking about just now, and come out with uh, various uh what they call that uh, marketing strategy tools, you know, to approach those who are actually interested to study. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, this is just an overview of what Malaysia's digital economy journey is. Uh, it stops at 2019, but now we have also our 12th Malaysia plan, which begins on 2020 to 2025. But our first start was to establish the multimedia super corridor, you know, uh, uh, where in 1996, where, the, the, where Malaysia wanted to make sure that everything is on track. So if you can see, all this uh, have been paved up uh, nicely, and now it's actually the implementation side of the uh, digital economy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, we have our Malaysian Digital Economy Blueprint, or My Digital, and it is uh, integrated with the Shared Prosperity Vision 2030 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and Chop Malaysia Plan. So Agenda for Sustainable Development, I believe, is also uh, referred to by all countries eh? because now we are moving towards a more ESG uh, economy, environmental sustainable development. It's not just pure profit, but we are also looking at the inclusivity. We are looking at how we actually contribute back to the society and how we take care of our environment. So if you look at the uh, just a snapshot of the documents just now, so uh, all these uh, document, uh, the 12 major plan act, uh, act actually also has mentioned that they are now looking at uh, technology adoption and innovation, how they can move forward, you know. So if we don't uh, go on and support the uh, technology path, therefore we will be left behind. And it's also looking at inclusivity, ethics, trust, and etc. So that's lots of things that 
uh, talking about digital. Thank you. Can we move on, please? Okay, for the uh, just to give a snapshot of the uh, economic uh, blueprint, a uh, digital economy blueprint, there are three policy objectives to encourage industry players to become creators, users, and adopters, harness human capital so that they have the uh, required skills eh, to move on, and nurture an integrated ecosystem. And if you look at the six strategic trusts, they will be looking at a driving digital transformation in the public sector so that these uh, the delivery of services can be more uh, efficient, boost economic competit competitiveness, build enabling digital infrastructure. So we cannot just say we want to do this, we do that, but there is no proper infrastructure in place and there's no coordination uh, amongst the ministries. Eh? So building human resource, digital talent is important. And also make sure that the rural, the elderly uh, are actually inclus included in the uh, step forward eh? and real trusted, secure and ethical digital environment. So it's very important that once we have this AI into being, there's no, no, what they call, no boundaries for us to know how transparent they are, how they're being done you know, to get the data. So ethics is very important. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so we'll be looking at the My Digital. We'll see that the Rakyat enjoy improving digital literacy. literacy. And as you can see, the highly demanded jobs will be those uh, that is associated with, with digital uh, technology. You know, So you must have experts in that. Businesses also, including the micro, small and medium enterprises, the government are looking at how they can actually improve uh, the online uh, platform, giving them the technical knowledge on how they can move forward and also the government. So these are the three aspects that you're looking at. And as you can see the on our PKP or the COVID, eh, during the COVID regime, eh, we can see that the businesses of MSMEs are actually booming because like it or not, they need to learn the technology of uh, online selling for them to survive. And even the universities, eh, like it or not, we had actually a plan to do it uh, over the years. But once PKP or the COVID uh, came uh, into uh, being, everybody was forced to, to teach online, to what they call prepare materials online, to give grading online, you know, everything is online. And even if I can share in our university uh, for our MBA programs, we, we cannot now sell the 100% on-campus uh, uh, programs. Because uh, mostly our working people and they would prefer to do online. So there's a 50-50% or 70-30% that partly uh, the programs should be online. Because everybody now can actually access anything on the uh, internet. And as lecturers also, we are feeling a little bit uh, what we call challenge actually. Because whenever we say something, the students will be checking whether the facts are correct over the internet. And they can get information. So what they want from us is actually to help to facilitate how to learn, not to get information because they can get that from chat GPT. And I learned from my friend that there is this uh, Gamma app where they can even prepare PowerPoint slide. And just to share for this particular uh, presentation that I wanted to do, they helped me to just gather information, but I did not use that. I just like to share that you can actually prepare the PowerPoint just based on the internet. So advantage is, is good, that it gives the overview of what's going on. But the disadvantage, I feel, is that um, we will not learn, you know, because everything is so easy. So I was telling them during my old days, when I did my PhD, I had to bring the index card, read the literature, write it down, and then make sure that it's filed properly. So that's not even filing using, uh, using the computer, but it's actually manually filed. But we know what's going on, what, why we think it's not relevant, why it's relevant, you know. So critically comment. But if you can get everything easily, I think there's nothing for the lecturers to do, even for the research methodology lecturer. They really need to think. The literature review now is not so much of a problem because the students can get literature all over the world, but how to manage the vast information so that we can still have a quality graduate at the end of the day who actually also think. It's not that they are not thinking, but since it's easy for them to get information, we need to put it put to them that uh, the thinking part is important for us to process so that we can go on and improve here. Yeah? So next slide, please. Uh, so this is opportunities for Malaysia once there is this uh, technology uh, into being. 
the society, business and government will surely uh, benefited from all that. Eh? We're looking for a more efficient service delivery, uh, tax filing, procurement process. So everything now is being uh, digitalized. Uh, what's now is to implement and make sure that it's done in the proper manner. So next slide. So uh, recently, uh, Amazon actually uh, invested $25.5 uh for a new infrastructure, infrastructure region in Malaysia. And uh, the investment uh, will surely be put to use according to our Prime Minister, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, to come up with a highly skilled, innovative, inclusive and sustainable economy where wealth is shared more equitably. So the AWS, uh, the what you call the Amazon Web Services, uh, uh, the uh, the objective is to create innovative digital services using the secure, high-performing, resilient, and trusted infrastructure. So lots, lots of investment coming into being. Documentation uh, has been laid down to make sure that the strategies are being carried out, etc. Right? So if we go to the next slide, please. Okay, uh, Malaysian Institute of Accountants. Uh, I think various uh, associations have also looked at the uh, how they're going to digital Digital, digitalized technology. For MIA, the Malaysian Institute of Accountants, they are looking at how uh, important uh, an accountant will be in the future, what they need to learn. There's no longer the tick and check uh, ruling for auditing, for example, because everything now is digitalized. But how they're going to make sure that they do not go obsolete, but uh, being on top of what is required to become uh, a more, what you call that, uh, needed a relevant accountant in the era of technology. So we are looking at five driving principles, big data analytics, cloud computing, automation, and artificial intelligence. And even in the auditing side, uh, to get the audit trail is very difficult now because everything is done online. Right. So how are they going to change the technique to keep up to the pace? Eh? So if we move on, please. This is a bit that I got from the uh, literature review that I've done. Eh? that uh, Indonesia also have their Indonesia Digital Roadmap, uh, uh, focusing on four strategic domains, modernizing digital infrastructure, uh, digital government, uh, focusing on SMEs or MSMEs, and then for the society. It's, it's about the same with what Malaysia has. And you also have the National Artificial Intelligence Strategy, eh? which uh, look at five strategic priority areas, health, bureaucratic, education, food security, smart city, and then again, the area of ethics and policies uh, has been brought up. So it's very important, although we are into uh, digitalization, but the ethics part should also be uh, looked at. Yeah? So from the uh, delivery of the Minister of Education, if I'm not mistaken this morning, I think there's lots more actually that you have done. And uh, we can say that the usage of IT for Indonesia is quite high. Eh? People are using the internet, TikTok. Uh, and then they are also using uh, AI eh, for their for their jobs. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. So just to share our little bit of our Malaysian budget, uh, which focuses on strengthening the digital economy. So now in 2024, uh, there is this uh, Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission that looks at how to propel the country towards becoming an innovative high-tech nation and how we can strengthen the digital economy. Budget of 25 million is given and then also allocated to uh, the MSMEs, 100 million. So you can look at the quantity and see how Malaysia is quite serious to actually uh, make sure that uh, the rakyat and the businesses and also the government agencies are, are propelling towards uh, having a, a more technology-based, uh, uh, what you call that, transactions and also understanding of how it's going to be reported and how it affects their operations and daily life. So if you can move on, please. So of course, uh, I think this is not, not to be highlighted here, but we know that there is this benefits of technology. Now people are using websites, blogs, so social networks, even our greeting cards, you know, uh, during Hari Raya or wedding cards, there's no longer this physical card. That usually during the old days, we hang it uh, outside the door or in the hall to show how many friends we have, you know, the good words that they say. So everything is now in, with music, you know, with with uh, what they call digitalization. So that's how things are going now. 
So usually last time when we had our wedding ceremony, we'll go from house to house to actually invite people to come over. So that's the changing landscape. Eh? Uh, the younger generation are wanting very fast things and to date uh, information. Eh? And people utilize the internet and notebook uh, and then uh, administrative processes also we have uh, done in Malaysia. And of course, uh, not forgetting the ATM machine, which is very important because we can actually take out our money even after office hours. Eh? So we move on, please. So these are some of the benefits of technology, which requires the, the collaboration, the collaborative effort of the government sector, the NGOs, communications and multimedia sector, and the academic sector. So uh, what the technology will do is it will be a change agent, contribute towards community development, improving skills and employability, empower individuals to become change agents, eh? And then there is a platform for advocacy and the development of a stronger ecosystem, connecting leaders. So with that technology, just like what we're having today, uh, I know Mr. Frankie now, I know somebody from Thailand, I know somebody from India, you know, all over the world. We've just uh, having one conference, you know. Uh, last time they have to be physically present. Now lots of costs can be saved, but we can get lots of information from the conference. So these are some of the things that the technology can give to us, eh? And now we can say that there's this uh, business and e-commerce. So everybody's talking about that. And entrepreneurship no longer can be talking about selling your products, but how you can be creative, innovative in terms of product uh, marketing strategy and also product development. So I guess uh, that's it. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so these are some of the digital transformation challenges uh, that I've read uh, in the literature and summarize it and, and also adopted uh, uh, adapted some of the information from the, uh, what you call that, the link there. So the most common digital transformation challenges are lack of organizational change management strategy. So usually organization, they are sort of uh, looking at uh, the more, I mean, resistance to change rather than coming forward and doing uh, what is best uh, maybe now because they need to do a lot of things, eh? changes in culture, mindset, processes, and it involves a lot of costs. Lack of expertise, uh, the right skill, you know, uh, to know about the cloud computing, mm -hmm. AI, machine learning. And then there's also continuous evaluation of customer needs. Customer always wants something different, just like what uh, Dr. Marissa was talking about just now. So instead of advertising what people want, they she actually mentioned about the company showcasing what, uh, what uh, are the challenges uh for the for the individual needs you see so that they want to learn more and more. Eh? So the, the way of marketing strategy, internal resistance to change, security concerns is also very important, and budget constraints. So from time to time, even uh, the universities face uh, a lot of issues because their data has been hacked, you know, that they cannot get information on time. So the minute they change to a new system, there's also delay. So there's lots of challenges actually to move uh, forward eh, to, to sort of adopt digital technology. So these are some of the things that uh, needs to be considered if one wants to move forward. So if you can move to the next slide, please. We'll be talking about actions to be taken eh, theoretically. Uh, what needs to be taken and afterwards I'll be sharing some inputs of what Indonesia and Malaysia has been ha has been doing you know to overcome the challenges. So in terms of organizational change management management, there should be uh, uh, developing strategies on how IT should be used in the company or organization, create a roadmap where they're going, how they're going to achieve, monitor and measure. For the upskilling, of course training to increase IT skills and sometimes, there needs to be a new recruitment, you know, uh, uh, with expertise in IT also to help in the advancement of IT in the organization. Meeting customers' needs, updated with new trends, trends, new ways and technologies, cultural change, raise awareness about importance of digital transformation and involving the whole team. Digital transformation, security, uh, security control, the IT department is very important, very important to look at new tools and technologies because the the the, the scammer or the hackers are very, very up to date. So there's going to be a great challenge to overcome all those. Eh? And then also, of course, the financial roadmap, budget base. We cannot run away from that because there's going to be uh, involvement, of course. Eh? But in summary, I can say that there's three factors that are important for successful digital transformation. The right strategy, 
the right mindset, the right skills. So strategy, of course, comes with the resources as well. So if we move on to the next slide. Okay, these are some of the initiatives that I've looked at the literature that uh, has been highlighted by Malaysia in Indonesia. The challenges are elderly with limited education, also rural residents with low literacy levels. And some of the initiatives, initiatives taken are training to develop skills, increase awareness of how to use uh, IT tools, edu educate on danger of usage of IT. And then accessibility to new technology, use of online payments such as e-wallet, GrabPay, online transfer, you know, uh, that should be made available uh, to tell them that they can actually make use of all these uh, payments, uh, uh, get methods eh, for them to be cashless, eh, not using cash. Cybercrime and cybersecurity, I think, was mentioned in Indonesian literature quite, uh, quite a number of times, eh, also in Malaysia, like I mentioned just now. So to educate concepts like password security, two-factor authentication, e-wallets, and communities uh, set up by various countries uh, in Malaysia, Indonesia, including to, to make sure that they are on top of the, uh, the scammers. So it's very important. So literacy is very important. Accessibility to new technology and the usage of the new technology and also cybercrime is very, very rampant now. Eh? So that's about Malaysia and Indonesia. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, just an example. Since we are talking about community development in Malaysia, so this might be uh, not a very recent example, but we have our tele centers, eh, uh, which began in 2000 and then it was initiated by our Ministry of Rural and Regional Development yeah, and uh, various ministries. And then how to actually uh, make sure that the rural area, so two villages actually was uh, picked up uh, by the government for them to do this experiment or to make sure that they turn these two, uh, two villages into mini rural transformation center where they're given the training, they're given the facilities, the online, the computer, etc. for them to actually communicate with each other. But now, uh, just to inform that there's various RTCs now in Malaysia. This was done uh, in back in 2000 where they started out with Jerangau village and Pasir Gajah village. Both are in Trunganu state, which is in the East Coast. Eh? In the East Coast, uh, uh, they, they have more rural uh, areas. So if you can move on to the next one, please. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is the example of the telecenter providing online facilities, global exposure. Eh? So they provided uh, rooms, classroom, eh? where the, the rural people can get together and tell uh, each other what they have, what are the problems, and if they have products to sell, what are the products they are selling. So uh, they provided all the infrastructure that's necessary for these two uh, rural villages for them to do the necessary uh, transaction. So we move on to the next slide, please. So these are the benefits. So uh, from the benefit, I've not written here, but uh, the, the, there is an increase of entrepreneurship there. Eh? And the, the two villagers managed to come up with uh, quite a huge amount of profit from their selling eh? because they are able now to do online selling. And then uh, the telecenter also has en enabled the local community to connect with friends, family eh? from various geographical boundaries. And they also thought to use uh, WhatsApp, Skype, you know, at that point in time, uh, these were the two, uh, uh, what you call that uh, technology was in place. And they also provide ICT rate related services, particularly to, do, to people who don't have access to these amenities. And they also have now placed uh, one stop center, you know, uh, the immigration office, uh, uh, and they also have uh, various offices there where they also need to renew ID, for example, or sending parcels elsewhere. So it's all in one stop center. So they started out with rural uh, transformation center and now it has grown so big. So this is an example of how technology has actually assisted the Malaysian community. If we can move on, please. So uh, for Indonesian, uh, browsing through the literature, uh, there is this uh, article by Jakarta Post eh, on unleashing, unleashing the power of AI for inclusive rural development in Indonesia. So they came out with digital listening tool. So it's being developed by the United Nations Development Program eh? uh, we are with certain other bodies, whereby they can hear what the rural people eh, from 75,000 villages eh, and 120 million residents want to say about their problem with uh, their products, you know, the agricultural products, 
how they can uh, actually, uh, what, what do they actually want more from the government. So it has actually uh, provided a place where people can be heard, people with disabilities, people in the rural area. So it becomes a very uh, inclusive uh, plan for the development in Indonesia. So this is one example. And then also uh, the AI projects in Indonesia, Tokopedia, AI Research Center, NVIDIA, AI Research and Development Center, and digitization of public services. So all these are being done in Indonesia. So everybody is moving towards having uh, strategies, plans, you know, uh, to make sure that they have met uh, not only the communities uh, or, and the citizens' needs, but also come up with uh, strategies on how uh, to make sure that everything is in place. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Uh, these are some examples which I uh, picked up from the literature. Uh, Ministry of Information and Communications, Republic of Indonesia, Car of District Internet Service Center, and South Sumatra's government implementing Wi-Fi area, uh, various locations, Palembang, uh, Sumatra, etc. So they have also done, I think, quite similar to the telecenter where they have picked up certain areas and they looked at how uh, the, the, the area progresses with technology eh, by providing them the, the correct infrastructure that they require. So if we move on, please. So I, I came across this article by Kamaruddin Khairul and et al. Sustaining Rural Livelihood Through Entrepreneurship and Creative Village Development, Malaysia and Indonesia Experience. It was done in 2020. And the paper actually uh, looks at key findings based on two kampongs or villages, Sayong, Kuala Kangsa, which is in Perak, Malaysia, and Gemawang Village at Semarang District, Central Java. So I would like to encourage if there are students here to maybe look at this if you're interested in this area. And the author mentioned that integrating technology is very substantial into rural development and, and can lead to enhanced economic productivity within communities. So they actually come up with that suggestion for, for the cultural village to grow. Uh, it is good for them to actually come up with their own products to make sure that there is sovereignty in what they produce. Eh? For Kampung Sayong, for example, we have this uh, labu, we call it. It's actually a vase made up of porcelain. So that's the, the, the unique uh, product that they sell. For Indonesia, uh, Samara, I think they came out with, uh, I forgot what, but but uh, something, a batik, sorry, batik, batik shirt or batik textile. Eh? So that's their unique product. But whatever it is, uh, the author says for them to grow further, they need to have uh, technology into rural development. Next one, please. Okay, I'm in my conclusion now, Mr. Frankie. I think uh, after that, we can uh, open for... <laughs> questions. Eh? Uh, so I think Malaysia and Indonesia have engaged in fruitful discussions concerning broadband services. So we have uh, uh, collaborated Malaysia and Indonesia eh? and then they also have shared their insights and experiences eh? and also integrate technology into rural development and multimedia commission and Indonesia's telecommunications are now working, working together to achieve uh, uh, this uh, objective of enhancing technology. And then, uh, if you know, uh, if if you want further details, actually, I've written a paper with uh, co-authors also Ibu Ratno and a few friends of mine on uh, this topic. So it will be published in the proceeding ICCD twenty twenty three. So I would like to uh, encourage that you go through the paper. It's more detailed on how Malaysia and Indonesia actually have worked together. So in the interest of time, I've actually skipped that portion. So if you move on to the next slide, the conclusion, please. Uh, last slide. Uh, so this is in conclusion. So the process of digital transformation in Malaysia and Indonesia has gone through uh, various stages and now both countries are moving towards IR 5.0. I remember when I was in the university, uh, 2019 it was IR 4.0, now it's IR 5.0. So, um, not uh, I mean, we are catching our breath to learn about IR 4.0 and now we have to learn about IR 5.0. I guess what we have to do now is keep changing and have a positive mindset that we can do it, you know, so that everybody will benefit. Eh? And thus, both countries actually have implemented the National Digital Transformation Projects. Eh? And then uh, you can look at the paper to know further. And even though the challenges of digital transformation may seem discouraging to some organizations, but with the right mindset, the right strategy and the right skills, successful digital transformation can be achieved 
and the benefits will justify all the effort. So I guess uh, that's my presentation, just to give an overall, overall view of what's going on in Malaysia, particularly a little bit of what's going on in Indonesia and how it has actually assisted the community, you know, and society and what is the uh, agenda to move forward and for, for both countries to think about uh, so that everybody will have uh, what you call that positive uh, input from both countries so that you can actually have a good uh, AI into place and eh, into practice. Thank you very much. Thank you for the attention. And Mr. Frankie, oh, over to you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so yes. much. Very awesome material that you are given to us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, um, before we send uh, the time to the participants already raised up, uh, I um I do so it for mistake and mention on your current university, ma'am. Yeah, no problem. Because, uh, yes, Professor Dato Dr. Hasna, uh, from Faculty of Economics and Muamalat University Science Islam Malaysia. Islam Malaysia. Thank you very Am much. Yes, that's correct. Yes, so okay. many universities in okay. Malaysia. <laughs> I can understand. Okay. And and okay, then for your you. information, we also have University Science Malaysia. And then now oh. I am with University Science Islam Malaysia. So even the names are quite close together. So oh, it's okay. Oh, great. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, we invite the three of you. Already raise your hands. Uh, for the first one is uh, from Bina Nusantara University, Wisnu Ivan Kusuma. You may ask your question, please. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. I think um, this is the beauty of joining the conferences, which allows us to learn from others' best practices. So, um, Dr. Hasna, to what extent is the Malaysian government policy, which uh, involving uh, various stakeholders in encouraging digital transformation, especially for business that are not ready for the digital technology disruptions, such as micro and small medium enterprises? Thank you. Okay, uh, all right. Thank you for the question. Actually, the government uh, is now in the process of allocating a lot of money uh, for the uh, uh, MSMEs for them to pick up the skills. So there's lots of training, forum that's going on, you know, to understand uh, what are the problems that the uh, MSMEs are facing. Uh, so uh, online, online selling uh, on how they can actually improve their products and all that I can see going on very, very rampantly. But the rest, uh, the, the micro, small enterprises might be a little bit delayed. But the advanced ones, you know, the uh, small and large, uh, small and medium, I think, are going uh, quite afar. Eh? So as I can see now, uh, lots of pumping in uh, of money. And then there's, they have, we have also our SME corporation that's actually hand-holding the the MSMEs uh, to actually go into this platform. Uh, for the detail um, uh, plans and all that, uh, I do not go into detail, but I know that there is very active participation now for them to invite those who are in the uh, MSMEs to participate uh, in selling the products, how to advertise, how to get loans, you know. And if, as you can see, uh, in Malaysia also now, the focus is more into B40. B40, for your information, are those who has income uh, less than 5,000, I think. I mean, it's quite the low level who are re really in need of money. Even when PKP comes about, they actually had no money actually to survive. So those are people who are having their businesses in small industries, you know, micro enterprises, are being given a lot of allocation for them to, to survive or to, to remain afloat in the business. Thank you. <laughs> yes, very nice discussion. Hopefully, um, Wisnu, um, the uh, professor already give you like a, a new perspective to to do some uh, your community service. Thank you so much. And for second participate who are ready to ask a new question, uh, Hari Nenobais. Hari Nenobais from University of Mustopo Beragama. You may ask your question, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Finky. Prof, early you explained the challenges of digital transformation in Malaysia. And now, what do you think are the main challenges of transformasi, digital transformation in Indonesia? It's almost the same or not? And can you give 
what is the solution for Indonesia digital transformasi. Thank you very much. Uh, when I read through the literature, I found that the challenges are actually quite the same. Uh, although Indonesia has highlighted uh, repeatedly about cyber crime, you know, cyber security, but at the same time, we need to be helping just like what the previous gentleman was asking, MSME, you know, micro, micro small, medium enterprises, because they are our backbone of economy. Uh, so we need to also make them more literate. So the same goes with Indonesia. That was also being brought up by the literature. And the other one is for those staying in the rural area, for the elder, elderly, so 60, 60 plus, you know, we, if we still remain, be, uh, remain in the university, we need to catch up uh, with what the technology is. So I think I've presented some points just now uh, with regards to the cybercrime. Uh, they, they have actually now... Uh, come up with various committees, set up various committees, you know, to how to overcome this Macau scam. For example, in the in Malaysia, uh, it's always in the story, in the media, where the uh, the head of the police force will be mentioning about they've caught several people doing this, doing that. So it creates an awareness of uh, the, the importance uh, not to trust people easily, you see? So uh, that's one thing. So the awareness, the training for us, for example, now using bank or uh, online bank transfer uh, from my experience, usually we just need to uh, give the tech number, right? And then we can get the money. But now there is two level authentication. Not only do we give the tech, but we also have uh, another level uh, where uh, whatever bank, lah, like CIMB Bank, for example, Bank Simpanan National, they will have another level of authentication. Then only the money will be released. So there's lots of information, small, small things that they have done to make sure that um, although we like technology, we want to learn technology, but we must know that there are various challenges. You know, Sometimes we are being, being very truthful, but technology can be used in many ways. For example, in one instance, if I can share, uh, this particular family was actually looking for a maid, okay? So there was this advertisement that they can get the maid for 60 ringgit, very, very cheap, and they can get it like tomorrow. But what happened is that they asked for uh, details. So when the, the, the individual actually uh, gave the details, so it was rejected, you know, the online banking was rejected. So thinking that the family thought that it was okay, so the money is not out yet. But when they checked their account, it has already been taken out. So uh, that means to say that they are very clever people. So I guess the challenges is actually now to use the technology, to know what are the latest technology. I mixed up with my academic friends who are much, much younger than me. So they tell me, they share with me that this, this chat GPT, there's gamma application or whatever. So many things that you need to learn. So I was wondering, how am I going to survive over the years? Because there's so many technology, do they need actually people uh, to actually now teach them because the students are so very clever now. They know what's going on. And uh, I guess the challenges are that. First, to know the technology and then to make use of how to use the technology, e-wallet and then QR code. So all those are actually new uh, for, my, for my age group. Yeah? And then also to make sure that I know that there is danger in using it. Don't trust it 100%. I guess the, the challenges are quite the same. So we want to focus uh, Indonesia and Malaysia on the small medium enterprises to make sure that they, they go on top of things because they are the backbone of our economy. And also at the same time to include the elderly and the rural areas and not, uh, not so much accessibility to uh, technology. And the third one is to make sure that they understand that there is danger in using technology. I, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, a very interesting uh, explanation, Professor. I I take a note from the previous uh, speakers, um, the transformation, digital transformation, starting with the human, the human behaviors, uh -huh. and hopefully the human really mm -hmm. can to be wise to use the yes. technology. Okay, yes. okay. Um, we invite Maya Mahara, Maya mm -hmm. Mahara from University Said for the last person for this uh, for this moment to ask him the question. You may. Um, Maya. Yeah. Thank you again, Mr. Frankie, uh, Mr. Moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I have already read the vision of Malaysia. Malaysia become a global center for halal industrial estate or park in 2020. 
And uh, my question is, I would like to know about the status of halal industrial estate as the digital transformation uh, has already uh, applied or implemented in halal industrial park or estate, Penang, Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maya. That's a very specific question on halal industry. Uh, Malaysia actually now, yes, uh, they are looking into this sector because they can see that there is demand, you know, by es especially Western countries on how we are making sure that the rakyat uh, has this halal food, halal products, etc. If, if you can see from the news, uh, there's lots of information about uh, what can be eaten, what cannot be eaten because of this uh, Sharia compliance and halal things. So in University Science Islam Malaysia, for example, we are into Sharia compliant in finance, you know, all are Sharia compliant in banking, in, in education, and also in halal industry business. But um, for the detail, I'm sure because halal industry is part of the business community per se at large. There's lots of allocation also has been made uh, into digitalizing them, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the what they call the AI, uh, the blockchain, you know, technology, and also into preparing uh, the businesses uh, on how the digi dig uh, digitization or technology can actually assist them in their business. But specifically, I'm so sorry, I cannot um, highlight what what is it. But since they are belonging to this industry and the government is very supportive of halal, if you can see. Most of the research now, PhD students are applying to do halal on halal things. And uh, of course, in, in USIM, we are also championing the Islamic institutions on wakaf, you know, how we can get more funding, how we can make sure that the zakat donation can actually be expanded and also on halal. So uh, they are now uh, making sure that uh, they are prepared. The industry are actually prepared with the required technology. So they've allocated a lot of money into that. Okay, even SMEs are actually into halal products, kan? Uh, so shampoo, for example, uh, food to eat, you know, so many things. Now I'm confused actually which one can be taken, which one cannot, you know. Uh, so that's it. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, area, the halal industry area, which is now booming. And uh, the, the government is giving allocation and the, the strategies, the organizers are actually looking at it. Uh, in a very broad manner on how they can actually put technology into practice. That's all I can give, Maya. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Maya, <laughs> for your specific question. Very nice <laughs> and very, uh, yeah, it's good questions. Uh, because the time is already, uh, the time is really limited, I do thank you so much for your presentation, Prof. And you, as Mr. appreciation, as appreciation, to you as, as as a good speaker the community already prepared a uh, certificate electronic certificate to you okay the committee you can share give the certificate to professor thank you very much thank you very much i thank yes. the committee and i thank everybody who organizes the conference and especially to mr frankie for a very good moderation so all the best to iccd Moving forward, that you can achieve whatever you want in the future, yeah? All the best. Thank you. So do you, ma'am. So do you. Thank you. Okay, the all participants, the last but not the least. The last but not the least. Uh, the, is the speaker, the speaker from Latrobe Business School. This is a very good school in Melbourne, Australia. Maliga Marimutu. Maliga Marimutu. Hi, Maliga. Oh, uh, hello. hello. Hello, Mr. Frank. Okay, your time to deliver your presentations. Thank you, Mr. Frankie. Um, I would like to once again express my gratitude and appreciation to the organizer and kudos to the organizing committee for organizing such a vibrant uh, conference today. I believe that all of us are enjoying our time from morning. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my slides with you and then the, we can go into the presentation. Let me share. Are you able to see my slide? Not yet, Malika. What's the Malika? Not yet. Is it coming on the way? Or? I started screen sharing.
Okay, Miss Mali, uh, Prof Maliga, do you want me to help you to share the screen? Yeah, okay. I think that would be good. Okay, Mr. Frankie, I will help Prof Maliga to share this. You may do so, Puti. Thanks. The collaboration is the best, I right, Maliga? I think I'm freezing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, Dr. Maliga, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, the committee, could you help uh, Maliga to deliver her presentations? Maybe something happened in technically? Okay, uh, Maliga was up. Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Frankie. I think Miss Maliga has out from this link Zoom. Can we uh, wait for a while? Yes, we do. we do. We wait for. Okay. I'm back. Is yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Maliga, your time. Okay. Thank you. Uh well, uh, well, everyone. Um, this is the title of the presentation. So it's actually. Uh, a work uh, of me with uh, Iburatno. If you can go to the next slides, please. Yeah, thank you. So actually what we have done is um, we try to uh, uh, connect to the theme of the uh, conference uh, where we wanted to see what are the research that has been done in the area of uh, technology in social welfare. So we try to look into um, 20 years past literature review and see how was the trend of the studies that has been conducted on technology in social welfare. So what we're going to present to you is uh, basically it's about uh, how the research in this area has progressed over the years, what has been the focus, and then how we can uh, kind of predict uh, the research should be in the coming years. So that's what we are going to focus in our presentation here. So can you please move to the next slide? Yeah. So as as what we can see is technology plays a very important role okay, in advancing social welfare uh, by enhancing the efficiency and accessibility. So the technology growth in social welfare has, um, has brought a lot of impacts uh, to various services and uh, initiative in, uh, in the uh, social welfare work. However, okay, there are a lot of uh, concerns as well, such as uh, ethical concerns, privacy issues, and there are issues in terms of uh, how technology worsening the existing inequalities, all that. So the message that we are getting here is um, how uh, it's basically it demand us to underscore the needs for thoughtful and inclusive approach to harness the benefit of the technology for the betterment of society. So it is very important to see how we should design the research in this area in order to make sure that we really capture the positive part of the technology uh, and then we can use those technology for the improvement of social welfare and that can lead to betterment of the society. Uh, next slide, please. So what you can see from the diagram here, you can see that the scope of the social worker. So these are usually the, the job description or the nature of the work of this social worker. 
And we can see that there are a lot of technology that has been used to enable support, bring some opportunities to inform decision making, and also to help with the resource allocation. So um, you have observed earlier presenters, uh, uh, we had uh, Marisa and also uh, uh, Dr. Prafasna, who have given us a lot of examples on how these technologies play an important role. And we can see that clearly in the context of social welfare. Like for example, we have a list of uh, technology that, that are being used extensively in social welfare to support social uh, works, uh, all those sort of things. Next slide, please. So some examples here is in terms of the telehealth services. Uh, there are a lot of remote area, underserved, uh, underserved uh, populations, people in the uh, area that, that's very hard to reach out. So technology play a very important role, especially with telehealth services. It leverage the technology to extend health services to the people that are not, not easily can be reached uh, without the support of technology. The other example is we can see in the context of digital platforms, how it facilitates communication and collaboration among social workers. And uh, some of the cases that are shared by our earlier presenter, Marisa, uh, actually can give some examples on how digital plat platform can help in terms of uh, communication and collaboration. And we can also see how this uh, online education platform help to contribute to skill development and empowerment of uh, social welfare uh, in terms of uh, making a lot of people to earn the knowledge of this social welfare. And social media is a very good example because it plays a very important role in creating the uh, advocacy, building uh, community, uh, and then uh, play a very important role in uh, awareness campaigns, fostering a sense of solidarity. So it is, it is a very important technology. And you would have also noticed that how mobile applications playing a very important role uh, in the area. And we have heard a lot in terms of virtual reality and artificial intelligence from the morning, how these two uh, interactive uh, tools uh, are playing a very important role in terms of uh, digital transform transformations. And we can obviously clearly notice that in the social welfare improvement area as well. So, uh, this, these are examples of uh, technologies that are widely used in the area of social welfare and uh, they are not only to help in terms of the operation, but they are also used for data analytics, things like that, where to gather the information, analyze the information and to think about how the services can be advanced, can be improved in future uh, in sort of that area or that. Uh, next slide, please. So when we conduct this uh, literature study, what we could notice is uh, most of the studies had been focused uh, in, the, in the context of welfare and social work. We can we notice that most of the research has focused on the individual technology, where they picked up on one particular technology and they showed that how this technology has helped to improve the sector. Like for example, it focused in telehealth, it focused on the uh, like uh, artificial intelligence, like that. But what is lacking here is we don't know what is the trend that behind the use of all this technology, all right? So the objective of this uh, research for the purpose of this presentation is to conduct a comprehensive literature review uh, for mapping analysis to describe the evolution of the research in the domain of social welfare in relation to technology. If we can move to the next slide, please. So what we have done is we have uh, designed four research questions uh, in order to understand the literature review. So the first research question is, what is the growth trajectory of publication in social welfare on topics related to technology? Uh, research question two is, what are the most frequent author keywords in the retrieved articles related to technology in social welfare? Third research question, what was the focus priority of the studies at different point of time? And the fourth research question, how have the trend evolved from consumer or client perspective? Next slide, please. So how the data has been gathered and analyzed is uh, basically um, we analyze the research publication uh, over the last 20 years from 2003 to 2023. 
uh, that comes from the Scopus database. So we have used this uh, bibliometric analysis approach in order to analyze those data. So this publication, which only covered the uh, paper that was published in peer reviewed journals, it, exclu it excludes book chapters and um, conference papers, all that. So these journal articles, they are from a discipline of business and management. And we use this keyword search query that you can see here, technology and social welfare in order to mine those publications. Next slide, please. So what we can see here is, this, is, this diagram shows to us the growth in the number of publications over the last 20 years. So what we can see is, there are publications in relation to social welfare and technology from 2003. Maybe it was this before 2003, but our research started from 2003. So we can see that there are publications. So what you can see to up to 2020, there are about good, decent, 30, about less than 30 publications published in a yearly basis. But from year 2020, we can observe a very, very drastic peak in the area, in the, in the research that conducted on this area of social welfare and technology. So there are huge increase in the number of publications. So this shows that this is this area is emerging. A lot of people are showing interest in this uh, research. Our data uh, were gathered from business and management. Uh, I have simply tried to run this in social science, humanities and other area. Pretty much I can see the similar pattern there. So it shows that if uh, we have postgraduate students, academics in this, um, uh, room here. So if anybody would like to look into the research in social welfare, technology is a very good area to tap into for uh, social welfare studies. And it will be, uh, I believe that it will be booming for the next few, next coming years. All right, next slide, please. All right, so from the 20 years of search, uh, we managed to find 2,942 articles. And we have screened those articles. Uh, we have looked into the, um, uh, we make sure there's a journal article, as I mentioned before, it is coming from a business and management disciplines. And we looked into the years, all that. So it went through the screening process and the number of selected papers is reduced to 462. And uh, again, that was, uh, we filtered the abstract of those 462 papers. We make sure that we are only uh, analyzing the papers in, that cover on technology, social welfare, and it has interest on the business and management issues. So that reduced the number of papers to 239. And uh, specifically, uh, we were interested also to look into uh, the consumption behavior at the individual customer level. So we had two set of data. One is the main, main data uh, for the overall analysis. And then we, for the second stage of the data analysis, which focus on the consumer behavior part only, we have 62 papers where we have done a systematic literature review on those 62 papers. So whatever I'm going to present to you after this onwards, it will be based on the data that, um, uh, the trend that we can see from the analysis of the papers. Next slide, please. So uh, what we can see, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to use the bibliometric uh, analysis. So this is what we are getting from the bibliometric analysis. It is showing us how these terms are connected each other. So our domain term here is social welfare. So where you can see what are the other terms construct that connected to social welfare, we can see the circle uh, in a different, different size here. So the bigger size of circle showing that there are more uh, connection to that construct and the smaller circle shows that there is less connection to the construct. So if we, if we take social welfare and if we see what other variable construct connected to social welfare, we can see other terms like uh, technology adoption, innovation, investment, profitability, commerce, economic and social effect, sustainability development, emission control, and supply chains. So there are these, there are these um, constructs are highly connected to social welfare. So what is it telling us is basically that when we look into studies on so, uh, technology in the context of social welfare, those studies have interests 
on other terminology that I listed just now, all right? So like sustainability, social effects, emission control, those sort of things. So that shows the how the area of uh, social welfare and technology immersed with other discipline, other area of research. Next slides, please. So what this slide is showing us is, uh, is how the approach or the focus of the studies have changed over the years. So this is the analysis of uh, the last 10 years data that we can see from year 2012 to 2022. So with this data that is 10 years old, what we have done is we split this into three categories. So you can see that from 2012 to 20, roughly 2014 like that, you can see the color are more blue colors, all right? And then from 2014 to 2020, all right, you can see that there are more mix of like green color. And then after 2020, you can see it's more yellow color, all right? So this color variation here shows the focus of the publication at that point of time. So when we look into the research on social welfare in connection to technology, if we look into the research that has been conducted from year 2012 to 2020, 14 or 2015, if we look into those blue color line here, we can see that uh, the concepts such as economic impact, technology transfer, uh, invest kind of a bit of an investment, right? Uh, internet, these were the area of focus of those research at that point of time, right? So that shows that those research at early point of time in the last decade, is more focused on securing the impacts. They want to see how this connection between social welfare and technology can secure impacts. And then moving to the latest studies in 2014 to 2020, we can see how like the terms that we can pick up at that point of time is like information sharing, innovation, sustainability, environmental protections, investment, commerce, profitability, economic and social effect are studies where it focus more on creating the impacts, right? They are not just securing the impact, they've gone beyond securing impact to creating impacts here. They want to see how uh, social welfare and technology can actually contribute to innovation, can actually contribute to sustainability. And we can see that compared to early years at this point of time, we can see that more uh, researchers, more research has been done in different, different areas that shows that the research has started to boom at that point of time. And then the latest studies after 2020, where you can see from color of orange or yellow here, not orange, yellow, sorry. You can see here that it's focused more on terms like uh, energy efficiency, green technology, decision-making, supply chain, blockchain, uh, and then elect, uh, yeah, blockchain technology, and mix a little bit on electronic commerce. So these studies, the very current studies, the focus of the very current studies is on, on innovating the impacts. So it has gone further beyond securing and creating impact where the current research are looking into how they can innovate the impact. Because now we have this artificial intelligence, virtual reality, right? Those sort of things, uh, big data analysis. So what we can do is we are able to, we have built that ability to analyze that data, to come up with some new invention, new model, all that. So this is what we can see that's happening in the social welfare uh, and uh, within the domain of uh, technology usage. Uh, next slide, please. All right. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we we want to pick one particular um, segment, all right, and then see how whether uh, uh, this is applicable in that particular segment or not. So we targeted a consumer behavior within the welfare technology context. So when we run the studies uh, on that consumer behavior segment only, pretty much we can see the similar pattern here. Like the early studies from 2012 to 2014, they focus on the technology adoption because this is these are the studies that at that point of time is more on uh, looking into how they can secure the impact. So they try to bring in all the technology that can help them in terms of the operation, bring efficiency, those sort of things. 
And then later studies, similarly, it focus on profitability, commerce, sustainability. So this is more in terms of generating the impact. And we can see the innovating the impact presence for the consume, consumption behavior oriented studies as well. Next slide, please. So within this uh, consumer consumption context, we can see that there are a lot of advancement of the technology here, right? What we understood here is uh, at different point of time, different technology were introduced that were advancing at that point of time to uh, introduce to improve the service of uh, social welfare. So this shows that study, use of technology in social welfare has a very high adaptability. So the social welfare se service sector, they adopt any technology that comes at that point of time. As long as those technology can help them to improve their service, they're happy to use those technology and move forward with those technology. That is what we can see. And also, they are not only just at the level of adopting the technology, but they want to optimize the technology for generating the impact, for innovating the impact. Next slide, please. So the main motivation of uh, this uh, technology adoption in the welfare service is for accessibility, efficiency, and data management. So when we see accessibility is uh, the social welfare sector want to see how uh, they can use the technology to enable remote access and also ensuring that beneficiaries can access support from anywhere. So they don't want to miss out uh, anyone. So we know that there are a lot of uh, vulnerable clients, customers. They can be vulnerable because of their age, because of the, uh, uh, the opportunities that they have or geographical location, all that. So what is technology is doing in social welfare is it's trying to overcome all those issues to make the technology accessible to everyone in the earth. And then efficiency is where um, the adoption of the technologies are focused on improving the administrative tasks, reduce the overhead costs, allowing resources to be directed to direct service resources, things like that. So efficiency is one, has been one of the main agenda of uh, social welfare service sectors to adopt technology. And another thing which we can see now, okay, earlier before 2017, I would say that accessibility and efficiency are the main key based on the data. But later years, when we, when we could see uh, innovating, the impact has become another agenda, data management become important, right? So that's where uh, we can see that the, how technology are being used to improve data system uh, and analytical that can help to create a data-driven decisions and deliver more targeted service has become a focus. So this has led the sector to head towards more towards sustainability, profitability, managing competitions and technology advancement. So we have heard from the uh, first presenter this morning, uh, spoke about uh, how the technology application is happening, those sort of things. Uh, you can see that how this is uh, connected, right? Uh, and it's not just a matter of uh, adopting the technology, but then how we want to make the application at the optimized uh, level that become uh, pretty uh, crucial, right? Uh, next slide, please. So this is what I mentioned just now. So that's basically uh, the use of the technology application is to achieve several solutions, like for example, streamline the service uh, delivery, like uh, simplify the apps and online uh, platforms and facilitate the efficient provision of the service to those it needs. So the the uh, the interest of adopting the technology in social welfare is not just for the sake of adopting the technology, but there should be clear focus on how by adopting this technology, we can make the service better and it can help to uh, resolve some problems, uh, give some solutions in the services that become very crucial. And then resource allocations, how the technology aids in optimizing the resource distribution to make sure that we don't leave anyone behind. Everyone will, will get the services that they are deserve for, right? And then the next one, enhanced communication. Uh, so uh, uh, earlier we had a presenter, uh, Dr. Marisa. She mentioned a lot about how technology can be used for communication, collaboration, network building, all that. So any technology over the years, uh, when, when uh, welfare services is adopting those technology, 
Enhancing communication is one of their important agenda. They foresee how they can improve the communication from time to time. So when we look into the adoption of this technology in the social welfare sector, the application of the technology become very important and we can analyze the application of the technology from these three key main area. So this is what we are we get from the literature based on the focus of the literature uh, over the last 20 years. Next slide, please. So what are the recommendations for future study? Uh, we heard from uh, Dr. Prafasna that uh, technology is a change agent, right? So when technology is a change agent, so what would be the next move of uh, uh, research in social welfare and actually to optimize this technology as a changed uh, agent. So what we could observe is uh, there are limited studies on the long-term impact of interactive technology of virtual reality and artificial intelligence. We know that this technology is still a new technology. So definitely it requires a lot of comprehensive studies. So if anyone interested to explore research in this area, so here, here you go. This is a good area to do research. There are a lot of uh, gaps that we can identify. And uh, the research is not only focused on the application part. It is also important to look into the uh, ethical implication of artificial intelligence in decision making. Because as I mentioned in my first slides, uh, it's always important to balance the use of this technology. And also, uh, also to look into insufficient analysis of the effectiveness and limitations of uh, virtual reality based on therapy in social work. Uh, it is very important for us to build a case-based uh, research um, because when we say technology, it can be very generic. So if we want to, uh, as, as for the interest of this paper, as we were interested to look into the in improving social welfare, so it's very important for us to see how this technology can be customized for the purpose of that particular sector. Not only for social work, any sector that we want to take technology uh, across, we need to make it very customized to the purpose of that particular sector. Otherwise, the studies would be pretty generic and it may not be able to give the full solution that that particular sector require. Uh, so these are the recommendations that we propose from what we found from the analysis of that 20 years uh, literature. Next slide, please. So the conclusion here is, um, so what we can see from this analysis and the mapping of the literature is, um, uh, yes, technology has transformed social welfare over the past of two decades uh, in the efforts of making the services more accessible and efficient. That, were, that has been the, the main uh, efforts uh, of the technology in this area. And later we can see that they have started to focus on the data management as well. So what we need to see in future is further research is needed to explore the implication and effectiveness of this interactive technology advancement in social welfare for addressing the existing gaps in the literature. So uh, these are the things that basically uh, uh, Ratna Devanti and I would like to share from our research. I hope that this could give some insight for the audience. Thank you for your time to listening to this presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Maliga, for your a nice and very interesting topic that you already delivered to us. And we're still on the timetable. And I do thank you for the all participants. Uh, remains a seat and hear the presentation from the from the since the the morning. Again, um. I do take a note from your from from your presentation, Malika. That uh, I and I do agree that the, the that the enhancing of technology must impact to social or human welfare. Okay, okay. Anyone you want to ask any question to the speakers? You can raise a hand yourself. You can you can raise your hands, please. Okay, I think uh, your your presentation is uh, clear enough, Mar Maliga, and uh, the committee already prepared uh, the certificate for you participating in our 
programs. The committee, can you give like a certificate to our speakers? Maliga, not Marisa. <laughs> That's Maliga. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Okay. Um, yeah, if I can on say behalf. All the, sorry, all, all, the, all the best with the conference. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Maliga. Thank you so much for your uh, support. And on behalf of the ICCD program 2023 um, committee, I wish all of the best, especially for our speakers, Dr. Sonali, Dr. Marisa, Professor Hasna, and, and Maliga PhD. I'm just realized, I'm just realized and surprised that the four speakers are women. Wow, yeah, marvelous woman. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much, Maliga. Thank you so much, um, uh, Marisa. Thank you so much, Dr. Sonali. And hopefully we can meet again for the next year programs. The finally, I would like to inform to all our, uh, you are here, the ICCD 2023 followed by participants coming from six countries. They are Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, India, Australia, and Hong Kong. It is nice to having you to all ICCD program 2023 and see you next year. And please allow me to leave and I do pass the next agenda to Ms. Citra Eka Putri. Bye. Bye, thank you so much, Mr. Frankie. It's really a wonderful day. Uh, we have uh, also a wonderful speaker today. Uh, all it's a woman speaker and the material is very interesting. Have a nice day to Mr. Frankie. Thank you for your time. And the next, I will inform for all participants to come and join after the break and preparation for parallel room. We will meet again after break. Take a break and lunch is very important, yeah. And we will be be back to the room for the parallel room and see you next. Thank you so much again for Mr. Frankie. Ladies and gentlemen, all the participants who have followed the event from the start to the finish. We have arrived at the end of the event. We would like to express our sincere thanks for holding the ICCD 2023 event, which was held a result of the collaboration of Professor Dr. Mustopo University, Binus University, Sahid University, Mercubuana University, and Budiluhur University. Before we closing the event, we need to taking a photo for a all participants, don't forget to open your cam and give a big and beautiful smile for this evening, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to open the cam. We can take a photo. The operator will be instruction me. We have a three slide, five or Oh, five slides, okay. Don't forget to open cam. Oh, many participants can open the cam, but we will taking a photo. Three, two, one, smile. Okay, and then next slide. Three, two, one. Okay, again, three, two, one. Okay, and the next slide, don't forget to smile. Oh my God, this is a beautiful smile, okay? Okay, thank you. Miss Tulus, you are so beautiful in this evening. <laughs> Your smile is making me feel good today, okay? 
Three, two, one, smile. Okay, last one, last one. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, thank you very much. I am Cireka Putri as a master ceremonial for today and entire committee say apologies if there are any mistake and shortcoming. We will build topic wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Take a applause for this event ICCD 2023. Thank you very much. Continue to be a campus building in the Kemanggisan area of West Jakarta. The Shadan Campus, the Kijang Campus, the Angra Campus, the JWC Campus, Binus Square, the Alam Sutra Campus, the Binus Aso Campus, the Bekasi Campus, the Malang Campus, the Bandung Campus, and the newest one at the Samarang Campus. As part of the continuation of the 2020 vision, Binus University has set a vision of Binus University 2035 a world-class university, fostering and empowering the society in building and serving the nation. The vision is equipped with strategic objectives as a guide to achieve the vision. Currently, the Binusian community is comprised of more than 170,000 Binusians. It has 55 study programs that have been accredited by the National Accreditation Board for Higher Education, School of Computer Science, School of Information Systems, School of Design, School of Accounting, Faculty of Engineering, Faculty of Digital Communication and Hotel and Tourism, Faculty of Humanities, Binus Online Learning, Binus International Program, Binus ASO School of Engineering, Double Major Program, Master Track Program, Binus Graduate Program, BBS Undergraduate Program, BBS Master Program, BBS Doctoral Program. Binus University implements the best academic system through a 2 plus 1 plus 1 academic system. Students are given the opportunity to experience different teaching and learning processes. It implements multi-campus mobility learning, minors and enrichment programs. Everything should run in the ultimate digital ecosystem. Keep moving forward and transform. Always attract new stakeholders and create new student experiences. All of this is done to achieve the quality target of Binus University, which is two in three graduates work for global companies or become entrepreneurs. Recording stopped. As a world-class Indonesian university, Binus University continues to make achievements by making outstanding performances at the global level. Performing activities at the international level, carrying out research activities such as True Research Interest Group and Research Center, and over time, it always plays an active role in fostering and empowering the society while contributing to the fight against COVID-19. As a form of embodiment of the vision, Binus University molds graduates who are full of exemplary character. Binus graduate attributes are embedded in every Binus University graduate. Sungguh sangat penting Anda mengingat ini supaya Anda tidak menjadi beban pada masyarakat, menjadi beban pemerintah karena tindakan-tindakan yang tidak baik terutama untuk korupsi dan sebagainya. Binus University dengan terpaksa akan mengambil kembali semua penghargaan yang diberikan kepada Anda. Work together to respect each other by growing, learning, and trying to move forward with appreciation. All these efforts are made to improve the quality of life of the nation towards a better Indonesia. University, a world-class university, fostering and empowering the society in building and serving the nation. Selamat datang di Universitas Sahid, Jakarta.
Jakarta, as the nation's capital, has several universities, both public and private. Universitas Merci Buana is one of the private universities that have a reputation at the national and international level. Universitas Merci Buana was founded by Mr. Haji Prabhu Sutejo in 1995. Universitas Merci Buana located in three areas in Jakarta, including in West Jakarta, Central Jakarta and South Jakarta. Universitas Merci Buana has various facilities to support the lecture process to be able to produce graduates who are ready to compete in the national and international arena. These facilities such as library, laboratory, The 
multimedia building. Comfortable classrooms. Doctoral building. International classroom. Professor Harrenzen Auditorium. Seventh floor auditorium. Sports facilities. Creative gym. Hall room. Bus. Dormitory. And all the supporting facilities. Universitas Murchibuana keep growing and making achievements. So what are you waiting for? Let's develop your interest, talent, and creativity with Universitas Rojibuana. Semua orang pasti belajar Bukan cuma mahasiswa Saya sebagai dosen juga terus belajar Belajar teknologi baru Belajar dari kasus-kasus baru Supaya saya bisa dapat pengalaman-pengalaman baru Kalau belajar formal itu udah pasti Tetapi kalau dilihat dari sisi lainnya Ketika berdiskusi dengan mahasiswa, tidak hanya mahasiswa yang belajar dari saya, tapi saya juga banyak belajar dari mereka. Apalagi saya, saya banyak dapat pelajaran dari orang tua, sahabat, lingkungan, dan pengalaman. Tapi, sebagai mahasiswa yang hidup di lingkungan akademis, saya banyak berdiskusi dengan dosen-dosen saya. Banyak pengalaman mereka yang bisa jadi sumber inspirasi dan motivasi. Pada akhirnya, kalau mau maju, kita selalu butuh orang lain. Daripada sendiri-sendiri, lebih baik kita belajar bersama untuk maju bersama. Supaya masa depan kita sama-sama cerah. Untuk masa depan Indonesia yang lebih cerah. International Conference and Community Development, ICCD 2023. By theme, digital transformation, development of science and technology in improving social welfare. Online conference, November 14, 
5th International Conference and Community Development, ICCD, 2023. Universitas Budi Luhur telah mengabdi dalam dunia pendidikan secara konsisten dan berkelanjutan. Dengan semangat mencerdaskan dan mengasah keluhuran budi. Berkomitmen terdepan dalam inovasi, teknologi, digitalisasi, dan pengembangan pembelajaran. Dengan menerapkan kurikulum Merdeka Belajar yang telah diimplementasikan dalam magang industri, membangun desa, pertukaran mahasiswa, dan proyek mandiri. Dilengkapi dengan berbagai fasilitas penunjang dalam peningkatan karir di Indonesia dan dunia. Universitas Budi Luhur telah menjalin kerjasama dalam negeri dan lembaga pendidikan tinggi dari luar negeri. Universitas Budi Luhur berkomitmen terdepan dalam inovasi, teknologi, digitalisasi, dan pengembangan pembelajaran. Salam Budi Luhur! Universitas Budi Luhur, generasi cerdas berbudi luhur.